have you now. They want to mess with my droid. They're going to pay for it. This is the way. You may fire when ready. Blow that piece of junk out of the sky! The way you're fighting, you wouldn't last a moment. Hello there. You know me! Hello and happy Tongs Day evening, or perhaps you're listening on Bindu Day morning. Whatever day or time you're listening, this is the Star Wars Station Communication Podcast. We have an awesome show for you today to talk about an amazing show, to talk about The Mandalorian Season 3, Chapter 19, The Convert. We have a lot of really cool stuff. We're going to break down this episode for you. We've got some predictions for the next episode. We've got a lot of Star Wars news to cover, and we've got the Star Wars moment of the week. We are really, really excited to hop into this. Um, And so, we have so much to consider about this episode. We've got all of the tie-ins, all of the subtle Easter eggs, the little bit slower pace than we're used to with The Mandalorian. And we're going to bring it all to you. Like I said, we've got our rapid reactions, and then we've got a lot going on. But first, let's hear from the New Republic rat racer himself, Colin Archer. Hey, thank you, Carter. Man, I'm excited to come to y'all every week and to have the best discussion that exists anywhere on the internet about the Mandalorian. We're living the dream, sir. And... To give you just the best taste of what you can get with listening to the Star Wars station, I want you to listen to these rapid reactions. He doesn't seem to take a hint, this guy. We know when we hear Django Fett that it's time for rapid reactions. Colin, this episode, a little slower, but not in a bad way. Just a little less action, a lot of plot buildup, and a few really good subtle Easter eggs. What did you think about this episode? I'm curious where Bo Katan is going to brood now. She's where's she going to be depressed at? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, it looks like she might have found a new family, um, but I don't think Paz Vizsla liked that very much. Um, I think that they're setting him up to have some kind of split and divergence from them. I think the old she doesn't know that's Paz Vizsla, to my knowledge, um, and Paz probably knows who she is, and so I think some old family drama is going to come up. Yeah, that's a very strange situation to be in, uh, brought into a religious cult like that. I'm, I'm sure she's kind of, you can kind of tell she's looking around at the end and like, oh my gosh, what have I got myself into? Well, and she's got some baggage that she's bringing along to this cult in that she knows that the mythosaur is down there and she's not telling anybody. Grogu doesn't know, and he's the only one that could have could have known. He's the only one that was awake at the time. Um, and so we have no idea. We have, or, and she knows completely. We know, and they have no idea. And so yeah. it's going to be really interesting when she breaks the news to them about the Mythosaur and how she decides to do it because they're headed back to Mandalore. I mean, they were, you know, the armorer said, You can join our covert, blah, blah, blah. Why are they a covert anymore? Mandalorians right. are not being hunted by the Empire. I mean, they are, but a much less powerful Empire. Why not go back to Mandalore? You know, it's non toxic. So the Mythosaur is coming up eventually. Are you sure? Is that much less powerful? How many bombers did we see? And all those TIE interceptors? That Somebody big is out there pulling some strings. I agree. It's a big threat. I'm not minimizing the threat of the Empire here, but come on. It's not the Galactic Empire. Palpatine's dead. Darth Vader's dead. It's The New Republic government is in place. So it has to yeah. be a much diminished power. Since you brought them up, what a depressing place to live. They erased their names. They give them menial jobs. A droid is the only person that interacts with them and makes them, you know, like their government liaison. And gosh, what a what a dreary place to live. I mean, they they said it themselves. This is not how the Empire would have treated people. I think they're grateful. I think that I think it's you know I I thought that. We see that the New Republic is willing to use some Imperial tactics. You know, they're tweaking the Mind Flayer. This is basically, you know, not allowing people to do heroin, but saying that opioids are still good for medical use. You know, it's the same thing. It's that this Mind Flayer machine is obviously dangerous, but it has some medical applications. Because I didn't think, I, under the under that scene's impression, I didn't think the New Republic was being malicious. Um, but obviously, the communications officer is being malicious. Um, yeah, so with what happened at the end... I mean, is like, is that the end for this character, or has she got some other motive? And 
in mind. I mean, because I think you erased my brain and she she changed she tuned that thing up, right? Yeah, I think there's some other motive here. Um, I don't think we've seen the last of Doctor Pershing. We spent way too much time with him this episode, and. We don't know why she set him up like that. I mean, we know she set him up because she's obviously evil and obviously still working for Gideon. But that wasn't... We still don't understand the whole process um, of how that got about. And I don't believe that it's just revenge on Pershing for for forsaking Gideon. Um, Right. That time we got to spend on Coruscant was a lot of of fun and it was really cool. Because this is... Yeah, big Andor vibes the whole time. Well, see, I think it was... It was Andor vibes and a juxtaposition to Andor vibes. They were showing the cubicles like they had Andor, but more space. You can talk to your coworkers, things like that. People are generally happier here. Then, you know, Andor was a lot of the Imperial District and a lot of the Underworld. And now we're seeing the same high life that we caught in Coruscant. I mean, did you catch that the theater that Pershing is speaking in and the stairs that he walks up are the same stairs that Anakin walks up right before Palpatine tells him the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise. Yeah, no, I didn't catch that. I, um, I'm on vacation. There's a little bit of stuff going on. My mind's in a lot of places. But that's a good call out. There's, I think there's tons of Easter eggs. On the train, all the different aliens, they reflected whatever comic book or picture that guy was reading in the window. I can't wait to put that on slow motion and figure out what that was. <laughs> right, right. That's going to take a deep dive right there and figure it out. Yeah. Very and cool stuff. The last episode. the last little Easter egg I want to talk about before we hop off of Rapid Reactions is they said Bindu Day. Um, and right. I'm really, really confused about what that means. I mean, did, you know, Hera talk about the Bindu and the New Republic thought that his sacrifice on Adelon was so important that they were going to make a day for him? I didn't really, I really was curious about what that meant there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure at all. You know, it could be that these uh, Republic heroes, they have such sway in how things were done, and they're looking for any reason to celebrate their release from the Empire. You right, know? right. Um, yeah. And, you know, well, Bindu's name, when they gave it to him in Star Wars Rebels, was originally um, a term used in the first Star Wars script because the Jedi were not just called Jedi, they were called the Jedi Bindu. Um, and that was their full name. So it could have just been a nod to the old Star Wars script also. Yeah, it could be. But with Dave Filoni involved, we have no idea. But those are our rapid reactions. If you're listening on Patreon, you've got this uh, about 12 hours earlier than we're going to be releasing our regular podcast. So you can be stewing all day. Come to our exclusive Discord channel and talk to us about all the things we didn't cover in this rapid reactions but that we're going to cover right now. Those rapid reactions are what we provide early to our patrons every single week. So if you want to check out our Patreon, our Instagram, our Twitter, you can do that at the links in the description of this podcast. Our Patreon has all kinds of exclusives that people can listen to. We don't normally plug our stuff at the beginning of episodes, but we've had kind of a growth in listeners lately, and so we want to make sure that everybody knows, and everybody's not just sticking to the right end to hear it, that we've got an awesome Star Wars community for you guys to join. We've got an Instagram. We've got a Twitter. The Instagram is StarWars.Station. The Twitter is SW underscore Station. We've got a Discord, a Facebook group, the Star Wars Station Cantina, and we've got an awesome Patreon with all kinds of tier rewards. Colin, what's some of the stuff that they can access on our Patreon? Uh, The easiest thing, the coolest thing that you can stick on your laptop or on your rear back glass of your big truck or your Naboo in one starfighter is a Star Wars station sticker. I have them all over the place. If you stop me on the street, I'll give you one. And then that's just the tip of the iceberg coming out soon. I think next month for our Patreon listeners is going to be our Star Wars RPG. I'm so excited for this. We've all come up with super unique characters with compelling backstories and a uh, pretty much a professional dungeon master, an aspiring professional dungeon master is going to be running it. He's got some great ideas. Um, I've never done an RPG, so I'm really looking forward to it. We're really excited about it. And that's, like Colin said, the tip of the iceberg. He just mentioned two things that are in our one and two dollar tiers. And we've got tiers going all the way up to a hundred dollars. We have tons of tiers in between. 
there is absolutely the right section in our Patreon for you. But that's enough about the Patreon. We're here to talk The Mandalorian, Chapter 19, The Convert. And so we are about to get right into the action, but I want to say one thing about it. And that's if you obviously, if you're listening to this, you've either seen the episode or you're totally comfortable with spoilers. And hopefully, if you're a huge Star Wars fan like we are, then you watched all of Andor. And a lot of people, when Andor was coming out, which I loved Andor, Colin loved Andor, but when a lot of when Andor was coming out, a lot of people were dragging the Mandalorian, saying it could never live up to Andor. It could never it could never reach the level of intrigue that Andor reached, and it could never grip audiences like Andor gripped audiences. And this episode proves them flat wrong. Yeah, the Andor is a lot more heady. It's a, it it's a way sophisticated it's complex there's a lot going on uh with behind the scenes things that you don't get to see sometimes and you know for the most part up until this point and really i think if you look behind the scenes a little bit in the mandalorian uh it's a spaghetti western it's um a samurai show it's a you know episode well, it's a classic sometimes. 60s yeah. serial yeah there you go and and so there's just it's just action scenes and the bounty hunter getting his uh getting what he wants you know but this one really spins that on its head yeah it absolutely does it really like you said it turns it upside down this is something that a tone that we haven't felt from the mandalorian in a while or ever actually and it really sets up the rest of the season this is a really good jumping off point For the rest of the season. So, you know, Colin, I think we should just jump right in. This episode was written, so the same writer for all the Mandalorian episodes is Jon Favreau, but he had help writing this episode. Noah Clore did his Mandalorian chapter 19. He also was a writer on the Book of Boba Fett. And so we got a lot of Noah Clore's, um, a lot of Noah Clore's Star Wars experience coming through in this Mandalorian episode. And it was directed by Lee Isaac Chung. But the episode opens up with Bo-Katan, where we left them at the end of Chapter 18, in the Minds of Mandalore. And Bo-Katan, again, you can't see these Mandalorians' faces, but the actors, through their body language, convey so much. Because you can see Bo-Katan's just body language is conveying she cannot believe that she just saw the Mythosaur. Yeah, she's flabbergasted. Uh, for lack of a better term, right? And then, uh, like, Grogu has no idea. They both went under, and he's just happy that they're back. Din is passed out. The first thing he does is start sputtering back to life. You know, can't do CPR on these guys. Didn't have to, I guess, thankfully, uh, because they want to keep their helmets on, especially Din at this point. But, yeah, she's just keep she's playing her cards close to the chest. And, you, you know, we as the audience... We know those questions, that there's something up, but he has no idea. He just plays it off. She says, did you see anything alive down there? So what is going on with that? Right. Like, why is Bo-Katan hiding the Mythosaur? And I have two divergent theories that I'm actually not confident in either, but these are the two perspectives that I could come up with when thinking why Bo would hide the Mythosaur. The first is that she wants to use it against the Children of the Watch. She still wants to retake Mandalore, and she wants to hide this information from them for some reason. Um, I don't mean literally ride the Mythosaur into battle against the Children of the Watch, but her, her use her knowledge to her advantage. Um, and I would think that'd be kind of an inconsistent characterization of Bo-Katan, because we've seen her really grow to be compassionate with Grogu and Din in a short order, and that would just kind of flip that on its head. Um, and then the other theory is she's genuinely scared. It... It spurred her to have a come-to-faith moment. It spurred her to have a conversion moment or spurred her to take Mandalorian ways a little more seriously. But she is stunned. I mean, she has no idea how to grapple with this. And she doesn't know how Din is going to react. She doesn't know how... or She doesn't know what the repercussions for the Children of the Watch this is going to have. I mean, she might not want to confirm that they're right all along about the ways of the Mandalore and about the history of Mandalore. She might not want that because it undermines her as a leader and her arguments. 
Yeah, um, I think you're right. I really want to build on this, but unfortunately, a too lot of it depends on speculation. I want to, and, and then what happens at the end of this episode? I want to circle back to this when we get to our uh, when I put my baby Yoda ears or Yoda ears on, <laughs> and right, right. we're going to talk about this and always in motion and continue this conversation. I have a lot to say about this. Uh, this okay, is, so we we'll keep yeah. moving through the episode. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, so we this, that, let me tackle this next scene. Go ahead. Because this, this is this is my jam right here. Well, I want to ask you about this, but I yes. want to touch on the this is the way real quick because did you oh, catch that yes. scene? Oh God, did I ever? Yeah, I, I'm too excited about the scenes immediately after this, right? Right. But, so the, yes, uh, the this, this is scene. the way scene. You know, you have Bo Katan and Din talking about how he is now redeemed. He is no longer an apostate. And she says, and he says, this is the way. And Bo-Katan responds with a sincere sounding, this is the way, um, which is impressive from Bo-Katan. First time we've heard her utter the words. And then we get Grogu babbling in the background. Um, And it's not coherent. It doesn't sound like he says, this is the way, but it's another just punch at him struggling to speak, struggling to say words um, yes. like a baby in real life and how they kind of just babble getting getting to build up to words. Um, so this may be his first word when, whenever the time comes around. Or, or something similar. And so permit me here, this is breadcrumbs. You know, we saw it with Pelimoto, the first breadcrumb, right? This is yeah, the second absolutely. breadcrumb that we're getting of Grogu's first words. And so... Um, you know, he's 53, 54 years old, obviously the agent. We've had lots of discussion about that. And so he's obviously still a baby. He can learn. He can comprehend a lot of things. He can pilot a ship, I guess, somewhat relatively well with the help of uh, an astromech, surely. But what the thing I want to say here is we know how uh, Yoda speaks. It's, it's a way to put your weapon and so many other examples that we can recite off the top of our head, right? Which is in contrast to Yaddle, who speaks perfectly normal. And so that leads me to ask the question, how does this species learn to communicate in common tongue, common galactic tongue? And I'm willing to bet there's some sort of, I don't want to say dyslexia, because it's it's inherent to the race, I want to say, but... There's some sort of jumbling of words in these person's head that makes it hard. That's my speculation. The only evidence I have is my own supposition about how uh, Grogu babbles, right? But he's able to comprehend. He's able to spit some stuff out. And in mimicking, if we assume he can mimic things like a baby does, but it's discombobulated so we can't understand it. Right. And so, you know, we recently got Yaddle speaking in perfect, normal, basic. Um, and like you said, we've always had Yoda speak the way that Yoda speaks. And so in the old Legends canon, the excuse for how Yoda spoke that way, because the other members of his species spoke normal, was that Yoda did that to put emphasis on what he said. He spoke basically like a prophet because he was this big religious leader that he needed people to see, hear the force behind his words. And this was a way to get people to pay attention to what he said. Um and that after doing could it for still be of years. It kind of stuck. I bet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. They, he needed he needed a little level of seriousness there, because um, he had to have been as cute as Grogu was when he was a baby. So yeah. <laughs> that you, Yoda just wanted to overcome the cuteness. Um, but then there's the other there's the other possibility that because it's the new canon, we have no explanation yet, and so they can do whatever they want. They can go with that old way, or they can change it up. Um, and really, a really simple way, if they want. Because Yoda is the much, much, much more recognizable member of that species. I mean, we only have only heard Yaddle talk in T- a Tales of the Jedi episode, and the animation is important, the animation is popular, but it doesn't hold a candle to how popular live-action stuff is. And so, so many more people who are watching The Mandalorian have been exposed to Yoda only, and they're familiar with that. And so it leads me to believe that they're going to want Grogu to speak like Yoda, and so they may just boil it down to a gender difference. Maybe the men of that species speak backwards and the females can speak perfect basic. I mean, that's that seems like a simple way to explain it away and keep Yaddle's characterization, 
you know, proper, and also the best way that they are going to be able to kind of explain this. Because imagine for a moment that Grogu speaks normal, especially knowing that his first words are possibly the last words of this season. Um, You're going to have fans speculating for a year or two about why he talks normal, and you're going to have fans who are not as hardcore be pretty confused about that because they've only ever been exposed to Yoda. And then they're just going to be like, so was Yoda a weirdo this whole time? And so I think I think that we're going to get an answer, but there's a lot of possibilities on where the answer is coming from. But I'm putting my money on Grogu Talks Backwards. Yeah, that's where my money is too. Excellent points, Carter. So the next part is exactly what you want to talk about. I want to hear you lead this discussion completely. I think I don't think I'm bold to say that Starfighter Battles are your favorite part of Star Wars. You loved Rogue One. You loved Return of the Jedi. You loved the scene in Revenge of the Sith because of the Starfighter battles. And so I would love for you to just give your unbridled opinions about the whole next portion of the show. Yes, excellent, excellent. So the, this is one of the last scenes we have from the trailer. And I incorrectly speculated it was a fighter. It's obviously not. It's Bo-Katan's uh, Mandalorian shuttle. And so they're heading back. You know, they've... Uh, been redeemed, or or uh, Din Djarin has been redeemed. I, I, what is it? Grogu should have taken a dip too. I was kind of miffed, miffed with that a little bit, but so they're heading back in the shuttle. Well, he doesn't have to be redeemed yet. He doesn't have a helmet yet. Well, but still, he's he's royalty somehow. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. He should have, he should have taken a dip. I dipped his toe in or something. Anyway, Bo Katan is piloting them all back to Kalavala. And just out of the blue, from nowhere, four TIE Interceptors show up. And TIE Interceptors is a big deal. What is it? 95% of what we get to see of Imperial fighter spacecraft is TIE fighters or or something, you know, like a shuttle or something made up like for Rogue One or something. Right. We've only seen Interceptors in live action once before, before this. And that was in... Return, Return of, the, of Jedi. the Jedi. For very, I mean, blink and you'll miss it scenes, we got to see the Interceptor, right? And Yeah, exactly. And so this is the most prominent live action, and it it's not just Interceptors flying around, it shows the pilots on more than one occasion in this. And it's, uh, well, I mean, who are we talking about here? Bo-Katan. She's in her late 50s, we can assume. Yeah, and we can speculate around there. Late forties, early fifties, late fifties. Her her timeline may be the messiest of any Star Wars character. Right. Um and they have not taken the opportunity to flesh that out yet. And and the point I want to make is, you know, when you're a pilot in the Star Wars universe and and you're in this age, this is this is where it's at. You only get better in your piloting skills. And so I, I pity the fools who Receive the orders like, yeah, I want you to go attack Bo-Katan. Uh, yeah, that's a death sentence, whatever. They're Imperials. I guess they're used to seeing their buddies get smoked like that. But Din takes the rear gunner slot. I think he kills one or two. But yeah, he, he knocks down it. one. He, I know yeah. he definitely knocks down one. <laughs> yeah, and so that was excellent watching just that happen because I didn't know these shuttles had a rear gunner slot. And then he does an extra cool maneuver of dropping out of the shuttle and hitting his jump pack just before he hits the ground. It, it makes me feel like I'm playing Call of Duty or something. I'm in dodging incoming fire from my parachute. <laughs> right. And, and, and he got and, uh, close to those TIE Interceptors. They were really as close ju- to him in the as air. As he jumped out, they barely missed him. It was, I mean, it's such a cool shot. I, he was almost know, a bug on a windshield. For a second. Right. Or I guess the I want, Beskar would have crashed right into the glass. Yeah. Or he should have whipped out the Darksaber, cut one in half. You know, that would have been the only better thing. I would have loved to have been a fly in this writer's room, putting storyboard and this whole thing together. That sure was great ideas. And then, so yeah, he gets in the N1. Well, and I want to mention one thing about his landing, in that I am very, very happy that he kind of scuffed the landing a little bit. He rolled, he fumbled a little bit in a much more realistic fashion than, say, like a superhero-style landing. Right. No um, and it's side. just <laughs> It just gives you the regular people, I don't have the force 
feel that Star Wars needs to maintain. Excellent point. Yeah, good, good on you. That that's a, that didn't even occur to me. That's why we do this, folks, so you can get that subtle little details in there. Anyway, so he barely he gets to the end of one and barely misses a, an interceptor shooting the landing pad. Uh, if he'd have waited mere moments slower, he would have gotten smoked. Uh, so he gets in the air, kills a couple more Tie Fighters, and this is I, two things are occurring here. Even though I know nothing's going to happen, I'm worried because Grogu's still on the shuttle. R five D four is still on the shuttle. He said they're worried the whole time. Bo Katan's uh, uh, talking him down, keeping him from fainting. I guess which he does at some point. And it's just hilarious. This little droid being it's scared. It's great comedy. It yeah. was great comedy. Yeah, and and this is the comic relief I like. You know, I. Me personally, I like the dad jokes because I'm a dad. I'm not going to not like those. But I can see how people react to that isn't 100%. But this R5-D4 has made me crack up in these scenes. And so I'm worried about Grogu. The second thing is is I wanted that Top Gun theme to start playing, man. Oh, man. Did you see yeah. Top Gun Maverick? Because oh my gosh. these scenes, if you, you know, listeners, if you haven't seen Top Gun Maverick, one, best movie of 2022 or one of the best movies of 2022 and so you've got to check it out but the specific scenes were like a parallel it felt like an homage to that movie yes yes bo katan specifically says don't worry i've flown in these canyons for a long time and oh i might be rusty she clips a couple of sides but it is top notch flying by her and the whole little interaction with these four tie interceptors culminates with her doing a split type maneuver where one of the wings of the shuttle turns back and she cuts her engine and does a, and in the X wing, uh, tabletop game, it's called a Coria grand turn or a short is a K turn. <laughs> and so she's, she stops for a minute, but is able to shoot the last tie interceptor out of the air herself instead of just running phenomenal positive by Bo-Katan. And you know, I'd like to mention that, you know, we have Din fly straight up in the air, cut his engines, and oh, come down. Yeah. And yeah. these specific maneuvers are the kind of gems that you can get in Star Wars piloting only in atmosphere. Like, I I really enjoy that the writers acknowledged that they were fighting in atmosphere and not in space. So maneuvers like this were something that they could take advantage of and something that the writers intentionally put in there because they were flying in atmosphere and not space. Din used the gravity to his ability. He's that good of a pilot that he understands how to pilot in space, how to pilot on a planet. I mean, we're playing that RPG soon. There there are specific character skills based on fighting in a fighting on a planet or piloting on a planet and piloting in space. And so it was really cool to even see the way those two elements are different. Right. The juxtaposition is phenomenal, which we got to see it started in space and ended on the planet. And then, yeah, and so Bo-Katan expertly kills the last TIE Interceptor, turns the engines on at the last second to avoid hitting the water, and they're both sitting at home. You know, they're ready to go, uh, I guess, have, have a feast or something at the castle, but then more tie, more uh, blips are on the radar, and they see plumes of smoke in the distance. And what's happening? This caught me off guard. Well, the whole thing did. Why are TIE Interceptors going after Bo-Katan or any Mandalorian ship? What do they care about a glass planet, you know? And But right. they, they bomb out her castle. It's rubble at the end of this. So let me seriously pose these questions to you. I have three questions, and you cannot um, defer these to predictions because these aren't predictions. <laughs> okay. These okay. are the justifications in this episode. Why did they... Sorry. How did they know that Bo-Katan and Mando and Grogu and R5 were coming back from Mandalore? Because they seemingly were waiting for them. Why bomb Bo-Katan's stronghold now? They know she's not in it. And she's been there for seemingly months or a year or two. Why bomb it now? Why not just take care of Bo-Katan? And then three, what's the strategic element of any of this decision making? Like what was the point of driving them to the planet... And what was the point of bombing the castle? Like, what's the what's the Empire or the Imperial Remnant or the First Order 
or any whatever this entity is, why are they making these decisions right here? So uh, let me answer that. And what we immediately see after the bombing is maybe 20 to 30 TIE interceptors specifically are, are the, the bombers are flying away. Bo-Katan is very upset, obviously. She said they destroyed my home. And then we see 20 TIE interceptors approaching them. And so they flee, rightfully so. They go up into space and jump to warp. And they don't answer any of these questions. They're going to go warp. hide out. Star Trek moment. <laughs> yeah, hyperspace. <laughs> Sorry. My, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Not warp, hyperspace. I, I, I get how many demerits, Carter? <laughs> I don't okay. know. That's quite a few. <laughs> That's quite a few. Um, but uh, my guess is there's some personal vendetta here going on. Because the TIE Interceptor isn't throwing around anything casual, right? Taking out somebody's personal home that survived the night of a thousand tears seems personal to me. And okay, so so what do we have here? We have a, an imperial person who commands a, a great deal of imperial hardware, who is ruthless enough to throw away. I mean, the whole plan of having just when they have this much firepower, right? Have four interceptors lure them away from the castle and so it's not i mean they could have destroyed the castle anytime with her in it or whatever right yeah and exactly. so it's not just that they destroyed her castle it's that they forced her to watch her castle be destroyed right i understand so, you're bringing so, it today you're definitely right. bringing it today and i think there's a yeah. line later on in the episode that reinforces what you're saying here yeah, yes, exactly right. Uh, I don't want to, I, I like to have our discussions progress and I'm not going to tip our hand on our discussion, right? So this person lured her away with a, with a honeypot, right? Because who, who doesn't want to kill Imperials, especially in right. this day and age? Especially, and then two ace pilots who want to get some trigger, more trigger time, who want to impress their kids uh, with, <laughs> right? Their so, kid. Their kid. You're well, already uh, shipping R- Bo Katan and, uh, and Dan together. I'm not R five. He's he's a child, right? Well, no, he's a veteran. He's older he than like them, probably. Child. He was in Attack <laughs> of the Clones. Yeah. Okay. So um lures them away, has a lot of firepower, is wanting to rub her nose in it that that this person can do whatever they want. And then and then pulls their trump card of like, all right. Now I'm going to get you, and and is is seemingly trying to kill him with a whole bunch of imperial firepower. Well, so they jump to hyperspace and get away. And so I, I think the other question you ask is, how do they know they were there? Um, well, we don't know yet, and the only thing we can do is speculate. And so somebody's watching Mandalore. Somebody has their eye on Bo-Katan. You know, previously in season two, Bo-Katan and her cohort stole a uh, Gozanti cruiser. cruiser. A Gozanti and, cruiser and then an Imperial light cruiser by the end. Right. And so, um, you know, if you're an Imperial, Bo-Katan and any surviving Mandalorian is on the top of your warrant list. And, and then Din Djarin as well for taking Grogu and getting Moff Gideon locked up. So... There's somebody with a personal vendetta against Mandalore and Mandalorians and Bo-Katan specifically, who has a lot of firepower and who wants to rub her nose in it, in the, in the dirt, proverbial dirt. That's perfect. The, gla- have, the glass dirt on Mandalore. <laughs> I have no notes. I have no notes at all. That was perfect. The only thing I'll add to that is that a cruiser, a light cruiser, does not hold that many TIE fighters. Doesn't hold no, that many doesn't. of any kind of TIE fighter, let alone interceptors. And of which, of this which interceptors came, are not capable this, of hyperspace. Exactly, and that's a very important point, is that those TIEs are not capable. So there is some larger command ship lurking around, and I'd venture to say it has to be Imperial Star Destroyer sized or larger. There's or no larger, way yep. that, any, that any ship smaller than an Imperial Star Destroyer could have had that complement of... TIE interceptors or TIE fighters, let alone TIE interceptors on it. So, you know, we have the nuisance of uh, Gorian Shard, Pirate King Gorian Shard, 
But this is the big bad. This is who it is. Right. For the rest exactly. of the season. You're right. This the Empire's it. And we learned that throughout this episode. So to keep us moving, we get the title screen after this. And the title of the episode, as we've already referenced, is The Convert. This, as you'll see, is a double meaning. And when you first see this, it confirms a lot of people's suspicions that perhaps Bo-Katan is going to embrace the way of the Mandalore, the way of the Children of the Watch. But we see throughout this episode that this, this title, like many of the titles of these episodes, and like good writers always do, has multiple meanings and deeper layers to it. So we get a hard cut with some dramatic, rising, really happy music um, to a Coruscant skyline. And we haven't been away from Coruscant that long in real life. We got it in with Andor around Christmas time. And so this is a different Coruscant, though, because Andor was a lot about the underworld of Coruscant, and it was a lot about the imperial high life of Coruscant and the elected life of Coruscant. This is two or three different looks at other parts of Coruscant. Because, I mean, it's an ecumenopolis. It's huge. There's so many aspects just to this one planet. And we've spent so much time with this one planet that we have. there's so many places to explore. And I think that the scale of the shots and the music and the beauty of Coruscant and just the buzzing life of Coruscant, we know that the Empire has been defeated. We know it's the time of the New Republic. It sets the whole tone for the episode. Yeah, it does. And there's so much going on here. Uh, man, I hope we could remember and know everything. This, this is going to take multiple watch-throughs. That, I mean, you mentioned it. I didn't know that word, ecumenopolis, until today. So I'm really good, happy for the vocabulary lesson. And <laughs> right. I, you know, it's existed in science fiction for quite a long time. Uh, the, the Before Star Wars came out, there was Trantor in Isaac Asimov's book. And right, right. that, as far as I know, Ecumenopolis wasn't uttered in those books. But, yeah. And the, the uh, we're going to get into this. There's a lot of little details. But this is a Coruscant lore episode. How cool is. is this thing? It is. It's a big deal. It's really neat to see. Um, and then, so... Eagle-eyed fans will notice that the very next scene is a set of red stairs. Um, on these red stairs, these are the same red stairs that Anakin ascended in Return of the or in Revenge of the Sith, leading into the theater where Palpatine discusses the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise. Um, also on these stairs is Baron Papanoida, an obscure background character who has no lines of dialogue. Some may call him a glup shitto. But I reference him because the character was played by George Lucas himself. And so this exact spot in this exact scene is where George Lucas would have stood. Not in real life, obviously. It's not the same set. But his character, not that just he invented, but that he encapsulated, or that he became, was where this scene was. And then, one of the big parallels that I saw in this, which I thought was great, great writing by John Favreau, is opening into this theater... You see Dr. Pershing talking, basically giving a space TED talk about the Republic Amnesty Program and how it saved his life. And we're going to cover that in just one moment. But he references in his speech cloning technology, and we have a lot to say about that. But in the place where Palpatine first introduced the concept of cheating death, not just to Anakin Skywalker, but to the Star Wars audience is the same place that Dr. Pershing is now referencing cloning the way that Palpatine cheated death. And I just thought that was an awesome parallel that Favreau wrote into this. Yeah, couldn't have said it better myself. And man, what what great scenes these are. It, that makes that scene so vast, the hologram. He tells that heart-wrenching story about his mom, how if she had a cloned organ, she would have lived. Um, now this is a this is a super some super interesting something that I'd like to ask you. So in where he's talking about his mother, he touches his ear where his where he has that blast shot and he does this little tick a couple times throughout the episode. This is obviously intentional. The director's told him to do this. Do we think this is just referencing the older episodes and is kind of a nervous tick for him? Do we think this is an indication that he is lying? 
Because I want to believe that Dr. Pershing is sincere in this episode. And I think that his character is kind of... um, The sincerity is kind of shown in his character in season one and season two, just through a couple lines of dialogue. So I want to believe he's sincere. But they didn't do the ear touch for nothing. So what do you think that could be? Or am I just crazy? You know, if it's a traumatic memory for him, there could be something... I mean, because... If you lose your parents in the Star Wars universe, you are forgotten about. Unless you have have a strong community that you're from, like, but it's the proverbial rural areas of the galaxy. You know, on Tatooine, you get taken in and you you get to be a street rat. If you live on the um, slums of the under under city in Coruscant, you get to go work for a gangster, work alongside Han Solo and stuff like that, right? And so. Uh, it turned out better for him because he got to go be a scientist. So uh, maybe that's some sort of emotional thing that got him out of the spot he was in, and he didn't end up being some sort of street rat like like you called me. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Rat racer. Rat racer. Yeah, you're not a street rat. You're just uh, you're one of the guys sitting in the cubicles typing away. You're you're part yeah, of the amnesty yeah. program. I like to believe. <laughs> <laughs> so that you know, gosh, it's so hard to speculate on this one. Because I agree with you. He felt sincere the whole time. You know, scientists in, in real life, but especially in fiction, are these hyper-driven people who care about the greater good. And that's, you know, kind of one of the things that we're going to get into is they want a means to an end. And in some cases, they don't care who they step on to get it. That's true. And they passionately just, care about their research, and they just want to get the research done. They don't care who's funding it. They don't care what the use. Well, they care what the uses are, but they don't care what the secondary uses are because they right. care. They care so passionately about their research. Right, and, and then think about what we're talking about here. We're not talking about like a, a form of bacta that works faster, or another food source, or an energy source. This is about cloning, and so you know, even in something like Star Wars, where a trillion people live on a planet, there are people who care about the individual lives, and cloning is, as we find out, the Republic has been banned. It's not something you just do casually. Right, right. And banned for good reason, because the Republic is familiar with the Clone War. The Republic is familiar with the aftermath of everything that was involved. Um, So he references cloning technology, and he references the breakthroughs of the Kaminoans. So, good Camino shout out. You know, we're on Coruscant. This is this episode Coruscant at night, Camino shout out. It's like an homage to Attack of the Clones. Um, but this is the reminder for everyone listening to this. Watch Bad Batch and listen to our coverage of Bad Batch. And if you don't want to watch yeah. Bad Batch, just listen to our coverage of Bad Batch because Bad Batch is really really important to all of this cloning thread. Um, there's there's yeah, it's not connections a that they're that they're airing these at the same time. It's, it can't Exactly. Be. Exactly. It is intentional that they want these Bad Batch episodes to likely wrap up while we're building this cloning arc around Mandalorian. I think they're really going to complement each other. It's like a nice wine with your steak dinner. You don't have to have the wine, but it's augmenting the meal so much. So if you can sit down and watch the Bad Batch to kind of get some, get some uh, perspective on this, because the Bad Batch is really ramping up the cloning, and if you're liking the scientist stuff around Dr. Pershing, then go check out those episodes of The Bad Batch that deal with that, because we're learning about the fallout of the Kaminoans cloning technology, and we're learning about the first stages of what strand casting could be. And I'm just going to say, I would not be surprised if we perhaps find a young, a young Dr. Pershing involved in The Bad Batch. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised either. I I would I would spin it like um, these episodes of The Mandalorian are the macro perspective, and you can get that micro perspective that I crave personally from the Bad Batch. Right, right, exactly. And then the most exciting part of the clone talk is Dr. Pershing references taking different strands, I'll say that again, different strands of DNA to create a new DNA helix, to essentially create a new being. And then, scene cut, next scene, he's walking down some steps, talking with some Coruscant elite, and he says, the casts, 
did not take the original casts, he calls them, which he's re- referencing them as combined DNA beings, he calls them casts, did not take at all to the procedure and they all died. The term strand and the term cast are not combined here, but they're in sentences back to back because the form of cloning where you combine different parts of DNA is called strand casting. And we find this throughout comic books, throughout novels in the Star Wars universe, and most specifically, we know that Supreme Leader Snoke from the sequel trilogy is a strand cast. He is a being that is wholly artificial and was created through DNA splicing. And strand casting, a very important aspect, is that they try to add the DNA of force-enhanced individuals. And so Snoke was a strand cast success, more or less. I mean, he looked a little messed up, but that was really it. Visually, he did, he was not aesthetically pleasing, but he did his job as a force-sensitive clone. Yes, the implications of these scenes are huge, and they lasted only a few moments. Blink and you'll miss some moments. Right, and it's, it's the kind of dissection right here. I mean, if, if you're a casual fan listening to this, it's totally understandable that you wouldn't catch that. And it'll be spelled out later in you know later seasons or just later in this season. It'll be spelled out a little more explicitly. But you want to be able to tell your friends around the, water cooler that, around the water cooler that you're in the know, that you know what's going on in The Mandalorian, that you've got, you've got two buddies, Carter and Colin, who can let you in on the secrets that, that, that's happening in these writers' rooms and happening on these storyboard panels. Right. Good points. So but yeah, these next parts, they're kind of rough. They, they are rough. Feel... <laughs> they are rough. They make and me feel bad. They're a they're a familiar theme in Star Wars. Um just this next little scene of him talking with the affluent Coruscanti. Um, they haven't changed. Every time the elite are written about in Star Wars, whether it's in novels, whether it's in Canto Bite, whether it's um on Coruscant, everywhere. They don't care about the plight of the wider galaxy. They don't care about the rebels or the empire. It's all the same to them. They're on the core world. Nothing's going to happen to them. They're very confident in themselves and in their, you know, in their own protection. We see this throughout Andor. We see this in a bunch of Star Wars media. And it's just the same. It's the same verses being repeated. They deride the out- outer rim. They're they're just living in the urban center. They have no care for these backwater planets. They can't even believe that Pershing was ever even out there. They think that that's just, you know, it is the Wild West to them. They have no concept. It's it's people in Victorian London referencing the American West. And it's right. it just, they have no concept of it. They can't even imagine what it's like. And it entertains them. It's the same as people living in Victorian London, reading about people on African safaris, reading about cowboys in the American West, because it's enchanting, but they would never, ever dare to go there themselves or to engage in that culture themselves. It's it's the same as it always has been with urban and rural divides and things like that. Yeah, it's, all, all that is beneath them, and it, it's kind of sad, doubly so, looking back on this, this scene, because you realize that Dr. Pershing is just an entertainment for them. He's an outsider. Yes, absolutely. And they are, you know, they're polite to him, and they're very happy that they're that he's on their side, but he's not in their level. I mean, he's just a scientist. Scientists are not on the same level as these uber-wealthy individuals. I mean, these are the same people, not literally, but these are the exact same type of people that we see in the Canto Bite scenes from The Last Jedi. I mean, they are, they, these, all of those people standing in that group have been to that casino. I guarantee it. <laughs> guarantee it. Yep. Um, so yeah, Colin, you mentioned this in our rapid reactions. And so I'd like you to kind of talk about the next couple scenes that we see of Pershing and his involvement in the Republic Amnesty and the reintegration program. Yeah. So these are really kind of harrowing, you know, think of these guys. So he, Dr. Pershing leaves the symposium or whatever it is, uh, the theater, and is taken to Amnesty Housing. I mean, just the name of that alone is sounds really dreary and droll. And uh, a droid is talking to him, and he's never been to, hasn't spent much time on Coruscant at all, ha- is leaving a re-education camp. What do they call that? A Republic Education Center? The reintegration, like the reintegration um I, it's not program. I don't remember what word they use, but the most important word in that is reintegration. Yeah. So, and then as soon as he gets there, 
there's some former Imperials there, and all they are, he's like, I'm L, what was his number? L46 or something? L52, I, I, L4, I think. L52 scientist. That's going to be my guess. Rest, that could also be yeah. the other important person's number, um, but 52 is one of their numbers. <laughs> right. But they're all just a number. They don't have names anymore. So they're living in cookie cutter houses. Their identities have been replaced. And they're just cogs in a machine at this point. It's I think so so I think you go too far on this. I think that obviously they are referential to their scientist names, but that when speaking with New Republic officials, Dr. Pershing is still given the honor of being referred to as Doctor. So they have not wholly stripped away his identity. Um, and I think that all of this is still a transitionary period to get them back integrated in the New Republic society. I still tend to think that the New Republic is well-meaning at this point. I mean, we are we are not very far removed from Return of the Jedi. We're not very far removed from the idealism of Leia and Mon Mothma and the whole Rebel Alliance. And so I, I would venture to say that while they have been given these designations and they are using these designations, that the intent is to at least give them their identity and reintegrate them into New Republic society when they understand that the Empire isn't inherently tied to their identity. Yeah, uh, I personally think it was handled poorly by the New Republic, especially in the scenes that we'll see later. Um, well, as they say, know, it's not how the Empire would have done it, so it's at yeah, least yeah. better than that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you God. think the Imperial Amnesty Program was out there for, I mean, it wasn't out there for Luke or Han, but for random rebel grunt? Absolutely not. They had the Spice Mines of Kessel and Narkina 5 lined up for those guys. Right. Or you died in the construction of one of the Death Stars. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they they each go around talking about what they miss. And, you know, I, I miss, Dr. Pershing misses the travel biscuits. And this sounds to me, for, for, he talks about it being from a ration pack. And so this kind of connects with me. You know, I didn't work for the Empire or something, anything, but I was a United States Marine, and I miss, I miss the rice in some of the MREs that I ate. <laughs> The rice? So I can, Why is the rice in an MRE better than uh, the rice you can cook at home? It's not. That's the oh, thing. Oh, okay. But, it had, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's a nostalgia thing, mostly. Sure, uh, sure. You're When you're out there and you're with just your buddies and there's no civilization and all you have to eat is that thing, it's it's something that that is creates a bond with the situation somehow. I don't know. Yeah. It's really hard to explain. I get it. I get it. I understand. I mean, I don't and literally so, get it. I, I don't, yeah, you know, sure. your experience, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So, uh, a, a box of these ration biscuits end up at Dr. Pershing's door. And so this is a telltale thing that is, we're going to find out later too in the episode that these guys where they have been reeducated, uh, it's how do we word this? There, there's still some callbacks to what they were doing that they haven't fully let their situation go, right? Um, you know, they're kind of worried about being perceived that they were part of a machine, like they're they didn't want to willingly be part of some machine that committed atrocities over and over, you know. Right, uh, right. They didn't call it out at the time, so there's like a badge of shame that they have to wear. And it's almost quite literal. They all walk around with a pin on their chest and in a specific uniform type thing. So everybody knows who they are. Everybody knows what their past is, and they it's inescapable, right? Right, so exactly. It, it, it's, and, and the show designers did such a phenomenal job with the lighting and their uniforms and how these actors were portrayed, is it just seems like a real harrowing existence. Yep. No, I understand. I understand. Um, and I think it's temporary, but, you know, you're coming at it from an angle where I feel like you might not think it's temporary, and we don't know the answer to that. Um, I want to point out that I think these scenes um, and some subsequent things that happen are were not originally planned for The Mandalorian. I'd be willing to bet that a lot of what we're seeing, especially this buildup of the New Republic and the involvement of the New Republic, is that, um, and all of these shots of Coruscant, 
is I'm going to bet this is recycled material from the scrapped Rangers of the New Republic show. Um, I was just kind of picking that up the whole time. And for those listening who are unfamiliar, the Rangers of the New Republic was a TV show they announced um, that was canceled after a situation happened surrounding Gina Carano. Um, and we we don't want to get into the situation or anything like that. It was, uh, it was just handled by Lucasfilm, um, however they saw fit. And part of that fallout was that Rangers of the New Republic was canceled. Um, but I don't know what they did. They had the story at least boarded, and I'm not sure if they didn't have a little bit written at the time. And so I think that they're they're putting some material from that show into this. What do you think about that, Colin? Yeah, that, hey, that sounds like a great idea. Because um, this is a lot of the information about the New Republic we haven't ever seen. And if it's about the New Republic and some sort of characters that, you know, what a ranger does is exist out in the wild to create, to accomplish tasks. And if they're of the New Republic, you know, this would be like a legal bounty hunter. Or right. somebody who does like an escort quest or something like that. <laughs> right, right. Or and, and somebody like a ranger would be perfectly willing to go after a, a, a refugee character like Dr. Pershing, which that's what I speculate is going to happen. We're going to get to that, though. Yes. No, you're right. You're right. And this is my favorite era in Star Wars. It was um, before Disney ever acquired it when it was just the EU and just Legends content. I mean, I ate up the post-Return of the Jedi era. It was exactly what I wanted to see because I really cared about the way the New Republic was set up. I mean, I cared about all aspects, the way their government was set up, their military, their relationship with the Jedi Order, and I still think this is the most interesting era in all of Star Wars. This is the era we're going to play our RPG in. And so I am really, I'm really happy that we're getting all of this New Republic content and we're really getting a glimpse of what the galaxy is like at this time. And obviously Mando has always been set in this timeline, but this is now a look at the wider galaxy beyond the Outer Rim and what's going on in the New Republic. Yeah, and lots of little details. Like here next we see Dr. Pershing in cubicles. He has a new job and he's a data entry clerk. Right, which is for a man of his pedigree and his um, experience. They even reference it. They're like, why is... You know, why are you down here? Like, shouldn't you're a doctor? Shouldn't you be, even if you're a part of the amnesty program, surely there's something more for you to do than enter data. Right. And this was like an opposite of a, of a, uh, operation paperclip type situation where they didn't want him that seemingly, or he was lost in the paperwork or fell through the cracks somehow. You know, the logical thing to do, I would think is here's another Star Trek thing, right? The logical thing to do would be, uh, you know, obviously he can't do his genetic cloning, but maybe some sort of uh, healing research or something. You right. Know? Yeah, he's not. He's still a scientist, regardless of what his previous research was on. I was interested that they weren't willing to use his experience at all, that um, even though cloning is banned, that he shouldn't. Right. You know, he should still be involved somehow. Um, and to point out so, these so cubicles what... real quick, you know, co-workers are talking to each other. Cubicles are spacious. There's a little bit of elements that you can see people making them their own. We saw cubicles in another Star Wars project, and we're going to keep referencing this Star Wars project. It's Andor. And those were Imperial cubicles, and that was just, I mean, really, they are showing us such a difference. Getting to look at Coruscant under the Empire and Coruscant under the New Republic is certainly a treat, especially this close back-to-back, because we're really seeing the nitty-gritty day-to-day how the New Republic and the Empire differ. It's not, the New Republic is not the Old Republic. They are not ran the same. This is a new third kind of government. And so seeing the way they're ran differently has been, it's been a treat, certainly. Yeah, aliens everywhere in the Mandalorian scenes, whereas in the Andor scenes, it's humans only. Yep, yep, absolutely. You're right. It's been, it's been very interesting. Yeah, so what is it with this, like... Anybody who's went from being a doctor and having a a purpose driven existence to being a data entry clerk is going to this sets up a resentment toward how he's being handled. Right. We get a taste of this. And also we see uh, he goes and has to speak to a droid and the droid asks him questions like, are you feeling anger or resentment towards your coworkers? And so. There's a impersonal connection right there. Right. That basically, like I said, he's just a cog in the machine. 
where before he was somebody important, uh, his skills and expertise isn't being put to use. And when they when it comes to time to sign the dotted line, a person can't even do it. He's just relegated to a droid checking on it. Right. So these are all very, like, you know, I wondered if they're testing these people. It makes you think, like, I don't want to say inhumane because there's a lot of alien species involved. We need to think, <laughs> we need to think a little bit broader than that. But right. Uh, but I guess in his case, he's a human. This is an inhumane treatment for him. Yeah, right. and and really, I want to. I also want to point out this is this episode is just filled with lore connections. You can do a really deep dive into the books and comics, and you're going to get a lot of perspective on this this episode specifically. This reeducation stuff, all of it, the interviews with the droids, the amnesty program, all of this was debuted years ago in a trilogy of books that's referred to as the Alphabet Squadron trilogy. The first book specifically called Alphabet Squadron has these re-education scenes just for a different character named Erica Quell, who was a TIE fighter pilot. Um, and this, it's, you know, her droid is actually a reprogrammed um, interrogation droid from A New Hope. And those are really neat scenes to read oh, um, yeah. and see the way that she reacts to this droid that was meant for torture being a therapist now. Um, but these scenes are all lining up. So if you're really liking this reintegrating Imperials into the New Republic and what it's like and kind of how this program got built and the way that the New Republic is handling even its first months as a new government, then I would really, really encourage you to check these books out because they are certainly what you're looking for if you enjoyed this aspect of this episode. You know, not everything in these scenes is is downtrodden or dark. The uh, There is a juxtaposition scene where Dr. Pershing, as we find out, her name is Eli Kane. I don't remember her number. I'd say that. But they go to a fair or a circus. It's it's really upbeat, uh, childlike music, whimsical music. Right. And one of the coolest things I've seen that really makes it is they're talking about the highest natural point on all of Coruscant is the is this? It's a rock stick. He's like, "What is that? It's a rock sticking out of the ground." Right. And it's even uh, as a viewer, I'm like, Umate. "What is the this?" The peak of Umate. It, it was so the cool. The peak of Umate. I thought it was going to be like a crashed ship or some chip chunk or something like that. Obviously not. It's just a rock, and I was overthinking it. But yeah, it surprised me immensely. And just the little scenes. They're eating these little light up popsicles, and she tricks him to try and go and touch the touch the tip. I thought something cool was going to happen, like he's going to react to it somehow. But a droid comes up and says, hey, please, please refrain from physical contact with Umate. Right, right. And very cool. It was, it was cool. Um, It got a, it got an audible reaction from Cassidy. She was like, what? Like it's, I mean, when you look at Coruscant and you see this sprawling metropolis, this ecumenopolis, as they call it, um, all over the planet seeing the only part of the surface that's natural, and it's this mountain that is the height of a person. I mean, and the mountain's not literally the height of a person, but that's all that's exposed is just a big boulder, basically. It is such a cool, like, it really frames Coruscant. Like you said, this is a Coruscant lore episode. Um, for people who grew up with the prequel trilogy as their, you know, initial Star Wars, like me, I mean, I saw the originals first, but I was growing up when the I was seven when Revenge of the Sith released. I was one when the Phantom Menace released, and so the Clone Wars and the prequel trilogy is like the Star Wars I was first really in steeped in, and so getting to see all of this about Coruscant is really really a treat. Yeah, so cool. So for a frame of reference, uh, on Earth, our planet Earth, Mount Everest, the tallest point is twenty nine thousand thirty five feet. Or it's at 8,850 meters. I don't know how tall it is in Coruscant. There's no frame of reference for that. But maybe it might give you some insight to how high up they actually are. Right, right. Um, and it's and there's buildings that tower over this peak. I mean, right. they are they tower over it. And so it's not even like this is, you know, this is the even close to the highest you can get on the planet like the like Everest is the highest you can get in the world. This is wholly different. This is just kind of a novelty because these buildings right. are so much higher than it. Yep, yeah, it would be the same as like you go and visit uh some 
historical marker outside of your town or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So we keep it going. We see these re-education scenes. Then we see him back in his cubicle, um, and we get a little bit of line of dialogue that the work he is doing is helping to dismantle and decommission the defunct Imperial fleet and the Alliance fleet. And so we know, because of the sequels, that the New Republic demilitarized at some point. And this was the, a push of Mon Mothma's, was to demilitarize the New Republic. And so by this time, that demilitarization is already in full swing, and they are currently dismantling and decommissioning all of their ships as well. And so that's just a little important tidbit that Mando is really, it's, it's guiding us and holding our hand to how the sequel, how the Star Wars universe of the sequels got to be how it is. Yeah, and these are really important scenes because he's, Dr. Pershing still has the drive to want to do better in the galaxy from his perspective, right? And he also has his friend that he's made, Eli Kane, encourage him, like, don't you want to do this? And to us, the viewer, it's kind of obvious that she has some sort of ulterior motive here. We have no idea what, but it's like encourage him to continue his research. Like, hey, we can, you know, and she's she's uh, leading him on. Like, she gets him these cookies, we find out later. Uh, or, right. Or what are the biscuits? And, uh, oh, well, we can set you. He, He's like, hey, why would I, how would I even do this work? I can't go do this. He asked one of the droids, can I, can I continue my work just on the side, like on a personal basis? And the droid immediately recites the letter of the law. You know, subsection right. the this, Coruscant so, Accords, which is yeah, basically the their Geneva Accords. Convention. Yeah, that that uh, cloning is illegal, and that's how we know that that they can't be doing that. He can't, you know, he has no job. He can't do his job le- legally. Right. right. Exactly. And so uh, he can't follow his passion. You know, it's like if they outlawed horses one day, you know, you can't ride <laughs> all horses. All the horse girls you, are devastated. Yeah, all, they're all devastated. <laughs> or or me. If you said, well, you can't own your Corvette. You got to go turn it in. I'm going to cry. Right. So <laughs> right, right. they basically did that to this guy. And, uh, but then he's got the bug in his ear, a lie cane. It's like, you can go get a, we can go get a mobile lab. What do you need to do this? He says, oh, I need a mobile lab. And she's like, well, I can get you one. We just have to leave our perimeter. So these guys, they only have a certain, the, the re-educated folks, they only have a certain area that they can even go. and Right. So, and the Imperial shipyard is certainly not somewhere that they can go. Right. Right. <laughs> and so uh, he can't take it anymore. His frustration builds being treated so impersonally, seeing all the equipment being destroyed. No hope for his future of continuing his research. And so he gives in and they go to the see and these are such cool scenes the art is and he so has well to done. he has to psych himself up to do it he's got a he looks himself in the mirrors you're helping the new republic it's the right thing to do and yeah. this is this scene is really the basis for my i think dr pershing is sincere i think that the re-education worked on him and i don't even think it was that hard because we see in scenes from season one and two that he cares about Grogu. He's, you know, I could only get this much without killing him. I don't want to kill the donor, is how he refers to Grogu. And he talks about how he's safe and how, you know, he does not want to kill Grogu. He cares about the science, but he's not trying to take life with his with his research. And so I really think this scene is the base. He's alone in his room. Like, if he was had any diabolical thoughts or he was maniacal about this, then there's no reason to do this scene. He's reluctant to even do it. He knows how valuable the New Republic has been to him. He know, he appreciates the amnesty program. And so he has to psych himself up to go do this. Yeah, excellent point. Does he touch his ear at any point during this? Did I, I didn't see. I couldn't tell. Or I mean, I'm sure I saw, but I don't remember specifically. Um, he He lays his uniform on his bed really neatly and like, you know, kind of straightens it out. Like, he wants to, he cares about this program. I sincerely, I've seen people on Twitter kind of take to it that, you know, he's lying when he touches his ear or that Dr. Pershing is not being wholly truthful. And maybe there's some white lies sprinkled in there or a little bit of, 
you know, bluster on his part to make sure that people know that he is a good New Republic man. But I don't think it's that much bluster. I think he sincerely believes it. And that's what makes these next scenes even more tragic. Yeah, so so tragic. They they hop on the train, on the subway. They sneak on the train. um, And they're headed to the Imperial Star Destroyer shipyard. Um, We have just a little bit of a tense moment on the train where the Coruscant police are checking tickets and they have to get away from them, but kind of subtly. We learn about Tong's Day. Um, Very important, very important. It's just their Monday, (laughs) I guess. Um, But we learn about that. Um, We have a great Glup Shitto, the giant guy with the long beard. He doesn't say a word, but he's great. He's awesome. Show stealer right there. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I got to find in the Mandalorian. You couldn't do this in Andor. You could not find your favorite Glup Shido in Andor. But in the Mandalorian, I think I've had someone that I've called out in every episode so far as this guy, best Glup Shido in the episode. Right. It was it was Pirate King Gorian Shard, then the Rodian on Tatooine, and now it's this guy. <laughs> yep. But they're doing such a good job with the aliens. They are, they, and they look real, and like the really the Mon Calamari in the much earlier scene with the Coruscant elite, he looked real. I mean, they the mouth was moving perfectly. He was making the Akbar sounds. I mean, they looked good in the original trilogy already, and so in the forty years we've progressed since Return of the Jedi, this has just gotten even more, even even better. Yeah, and so it's they look really good. There's some aliens that look better than others always. Like they've got Rodians down. Um, but th- they just, all the aliens in Mando have been impeccable so far. Great job from that team. Um, but so they're on the train, then they hop off the train and they get to the Imperial Destroyer shipyards. And this is where we learn of the communication officer's name, Elia Kane. Yeah. So they're kind of outside their perimeter and like we can, it's almost like a, we can go and be back who we are type scene. You know, they're almost, dare I say at home on those on that parked Imperial ship. It's kind of, kind of deep to think about. They are. I mean, and they, these people have spent their whole lives aboard these vessels. I mean, they're not, neither of them are very old. They're not young, but they're not old. Yeah. Training so, academies or brought up or all these. Exactly. Other they are, they have been steeped in the empire. The empire really, I mean, this is the, since the empire's establishment has been a roughly, we don't have the exact timeline, but it's been, roughly 28 years and they are you know they're either just a little under that or just a little older than that so they've basically only known the empire in their lives um and Elia Kane makes reference to this um when they begin stealing lab equipment he's kind of asking her about what she want to be when she grew up and she's I didn't have a choice um and she talks about her time in the academy before this so she was basically destined to be part of the imperial military right and, yeah, so they dig around in the ship. They find the lab. Dr. Persia remarks how he felt so, what did he say? He was just overcome with joy to be able to be working in a lab. You know, he'd never seen anything like it. And so how right. he was felt like he's going to get so much work done. And so this is obviously stirring up those feelings again. And he's, like, on this new path of being able to, continue his work and everything's coming along you know up to this point you know he he's felt real nervous stepping through the train station being pursued by the droid police officers jumping off the train you know these are all an, antithetical to his character in that he's he's just done what he's told his whole life i hear somebody taking him out of bounds well now he's on the cusp he's ready to hit the ground running his research is coming back and it all blows up in his face. I know. And the big setup reveal definitely shocked me. I did not see it coming. I didn't think there was much, you know, setup for this or much subtle hinting at this. I didn't think that her motives were pure, but I did not think that she was working for the New Republic. Um, And that's exactly what it was, is she set him up, she called in the law, um, and the New Republic arrest Dr. Pershing and they don't arrest her. So she was obviously working in tandem with the New Republic. And man, I felt awful for Dr. Pershing because like I said, I think he's sincere. And so seeing this, seeing that he just wanted to help the New Republic with his cloning technology, he just wanted to continue his research and he was so dedicated to the amnesty program and they're just not going to hear him out. 
And that is, it was very sad. It was kind of crushing to see that. I was like, this is, this is tough to see right here. And we, we don't know this character very well. We've known this character as a real, like, backstory, get to know your character just in this episode. And so that was just another, just like, man, I feel so bad for this guy. Yeah, it's awful. I mean, to have somebody, I mean, for all we knew, there was some sort of romantic relationship. You know, he's real friendly with her. Uh, uh, that I got kind of real subtle vibes of that myself. I, I mean, because when you go through perils with somebody like this, you, you, you develop a bond. So to have this kind of thing blow up in his face, it's awful. Yeah, it's very sad. It is super sad. And really, even if it isn't a romantic relationship, I mean, it's his first serious friend, you know, maybe ever. Because you didn't, they reference... You didn't say hi to each other in the Empire. You didn't know each other's names. No, this is the said, only place where he's really made any kind of relationship. And it yeah. was built on them both seemingly hating Gideon and yeah, being said, a part of Gideon's program. She said, I think I passed you a hundred times in the corridors and didn't say right. anything. Right. And, you know, I think we missed something a little bit. So the communications officer was obviously part of Gideon, If um, Gideon's crew. If you watch the episode, then you know that. Um, but there's two important references to Gideon in this, in that Moff Gideon, the rumor is he has escaped the war tribunal, or on route to the war tribunal. That's certainly it. I mean, that's, that's, they, they reference that he might have been hooked to a mind flayer, and we learn about that very, in just a second. Um, and then the other reference is, is when one of the Imperial officers finds out that Elia Kane worked for Gideon, he gets kind of quiet, and he's like, I, I didn't realize that's who you worked for. <laughs> Meaning that Gideon was a bad guy as far as the Empire is concerned. He's not just a bad guy to the Mandalorians or the Rebels, but other Imperials think that he was a bad guy. Right, and so we kind of see parallels in real life. You know, there's military generals or uh, political leaders from our own history that were awful to people. And this is what this harkens to to me. Yeah, and, yeah you're and, absolutely And so, right. I mean, just, just such a notorious reputation that's like whoa really i mean because because as big as the empire is it's it's still a small community when you're talking about these upper class moths you know there were only so many moths they went to a a moth conference or a moth convention and they had all their adjectives <laughs> right. with them and so they they you could probably go on the hollow nets and pull up who's the moth of my sector and all this stuff and and you know, if you had a complaint or something and it was going to the top, he was the one in your sector. And so they'd be like, oh, my gosh, I'm glad I don't live in his sector. <laughs> yep. I'm yep. glad You're I don't right. work under his command. <laughs> kind, of, kind, of, kind of those things, you know. Exactly. And, I mean, like in like in all militaries, there were worse governors, or worse moths and better moths. And so the Imperials could tell who was more benevolent and who wasn't more benevolent. I mean, and there were some worlds who, you know. Whole planets never had a problem with the Empire. That was maybe due because they served an Imperial purpose or they were an affluent world, or it could have just been that they had a more benevolent Moff. The Moff was still a part of the Empire. He was still helping. He was still a party to the atrocities of the Empire. But as far as his sector was concerned, he just cared about order and the people underneath him just cared about order. And so it's not like there was this universal, they're all evil sentiment in the Empire because that's just not realistic. It was right. really there are evil folks, and then there are people who are just part of the program. They see an occasional benefit of what the Empire might be, and that overshadows all of the atrocities that the Empire had committed. Or they were unaware of all the atrocities that the Empire had committed. And with the way the Empire was organized, it allowed for these unscrupulous people to take advantage of their situations and rise to the top. Kind of, like we say, the colloquialism is the cream rises to the top. That's not the case in these hyper authoritarian regimes. Is is the corrupt sinks at the bottom and just ruin everything. <laughs> right, the spoiled milk is coming out right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, the uh, this next scene we see Doctor Pershing after his arrest is strapped to a table in real um Bad Batch crosshair fashion from the latest episode of the Bad Batch, the Outpost. Um, really similar to scenes from Andor when um, when they're on Ferrix and they're torturing Bix, Colleen, 
And there's just a lot of parallels of recent Star Wars here that shows, I mean, really, not even just recent Star Wars. I mean, Han Solo getting tortured on, um, in Empire Strikes Back, Leia getting tortured in A New Hope. It's all a lot like this, um, strapped to a table, just freaking out. This, this um, and it's Republic. being done by the New Republic. Yeah, yeah exactly. The same as the old <laughs> stuff. Or at least we've been led to believe, right? So this is another huge deal. Well, I don't want to say, I want to get out in front of that and say, I do not think that it is the same as the old stuff. And I do not think that the New Republic even had negative intentions with this technology. I said this in Rapid Reactions. Any kind of medical technology or scientific technology has benevolent and malevolent applications. There's nuclear power and the nuclear bomb. There's, you know, medicines that we take, and then there's opioid abuse. There is all kinds of actual scientific examples of the good and the bad that can be done with science, and I believe the New Republic was legitimately using this tool for good, but they're strapping a guy to a table and putting him in a, in a machine against his will. That is not good, and that is an exact well, juxtaposition a, to all of these scenes that we were talking about. Without I just a referenced. trial, too. You know, there wasn't a jury, there wasn't a judge. It was just some, for all we know, bureaucrats overseeing this. And then, I mean, what do you do with these guys? You know, we don't even know, like, is, what's her name? Eli Kane. Is she a double agent? I mean, because, like... Oh, certainly my, so. My speculation up to this so. point was she had some, you know, because... Cause, and, and, yeah, certainly so. Well, we're getting into speculations, right? Well, we're going to answer that question. Is she a double agent here soon? Right, right. But so... Pershing strapped to the table. The New Republic, it's an um it's a Mon Cal, uh, not really a doctor. We don't know what he is, but he's trying to calm him down, saying, you know, we're gonna hook you up to this machine. We're just gonna help you get rid of some of those traumatic memories. Um, and then Pershing goes, This is a mind flare. Um, and I have to tell you that until we saw the machine, I had wires crossed in my brain, and I was thinking that the mind flare was the boar gullet from Rogue One. You know, that nasty <laughs> oh, yeah. tentacle thing that they hook Bodhi Rook up to? I was thinking that was the same thing. Um, and it's basically, that's like the organic version of the Mind Flayer, right. it sounds like. It sounds like just, they made a technological boar gullet. Um, but so, and there's another scene that juxtaposes with this. I mean, this is a recurrent theme throughout a lot of Star Wars. Um, but this machine, they're saying, you know, it's low power, it's just going to kind of help him forget these traumatic memories. It's not to wipe his mind. It's not to scramble his brain like some eggs, um, which is what the imperial, what the uh, amnesty, Im imperial amnesty officers imply uh, in the earlier part is that Moff Gideon got hooked up to one of these and it killed him. Um, yes. And it killed him in a bad way. It tortured him and scrambled his brain. Um, and that's what we're led to believe this machine can do. Um, and I think, again... Good intentions gone wrong are throughout this episode. The New Republic's use of this machine is good intentions gone wrong. Pershing is good intentions gone wrong. And the Mon Cal even tries to calm him down. When Pershing goes, this is a mind flare. You're going to erase my memory, blah, blah, blah. The Mon Cal just goes, this isn't the Empire, son. Um, and it's like the least genuine sounding delivery ever. He, I, again, I think he means it, but... That is not comforting words when you're strapped to a table with I a machine imagine. that you know can scramble your brains right on right. top of you. Well, as we find out immediately after, the Elia, the um, toy lake operating the machine, leaves the room for some reason, and she cranks it up while she's yep. taking a bite of an imperial biscuit. Yep, and the, the and lightning turns from a soft blue with Pershing kind of being like, ah, oh, pretty colors, to just like, Twitching on the table, obviously cooking his brain. Yeah. So, so, um, more questions to answer here. Is is this the end of Doctor Pershing's story? And man, what a See, deal! That was what Cassidy's theory. I'll 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 espouse Cassidy's theory real quick. At the end of those scenes, she was like, "That's you know, that's it." They were trying to scramble his brains so no one could. Um, you know, replicate what he was doing with cloning technology. No one could follow the trail of what the Empire is trying to do with cloning technology. With yeah, under the assumption that Pershing is not the only scientist working on this for the Empire. Um, yeah, or, or they had all this stuff anyway. Somehow. Right, exactly. And so she thinks that Elia Kane was there to just take care, take care of the job. You know, cut, cut up loose ends. Um, 
I'm on the I'm on the train that he is getting his brain scrambled so he'll be easier for the Empire to control now. That he's going to get busted out of here with a lie of cane, and that's where he's headed is to back to the Empire, and he'll you know be much more complacent. Yeah, yep. Good speculations. So what happens next? Th- that was the end of this you know long forty minute chunk where we didn't get any Mando. This was a little reminiscent of the Book of Boba Fett episodes, but this was of where you know Boba Fett wasn't in much of those for the for episode five and six. But this was, a, I think, really important. I've heard some complaints about these Coruscant scenes. And really, I would just say, how else would they have set up the greater storyline? Like, this amount of information could not have been delivered in a couple lines of dialogue with Mando encountering some Imperials or some New Republic officers or something like that. I'm not even confident that it could have been sprinkled throughout the story. I think we had to get these Coruscant scenes out of complete necessity and that they are directly important to the plot of The Mandalorian. The criticism surrounding those scenes in the Book of Boba Fett was not just that Boba Fett wasn't in them, but that they were not directly important to Boba Fett's story. These are characters that Mando, at least Dr. Pershing, has had multiple interactions with, multiple encounters with, so I think this is very important to his story. I see no problem with these 40 minutes being spent on Coruscant. Yeah, I don't think it's any coincidence at the start of this episode begins with Imperials chasing after our titular characters. And then Ian is spent most on a former Imperials. All of this is going to tie in somehow. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you're certainly right. And so the, the, these, this episode is began and bookended with scenes with Din and Bo-Katan. So we saw the fight. We referenced that at the beginning. And now we get them jumping out of hyperspace and coming back onto this desert slash water world that the Mandalorian covert's hanging out on. They come out, Dan explains, for our benefit as well as Bo-Katan's, that this is where the covert is. Um, that aside, it's we secret. have no idea what the name of this planet is. True, that's true. And this is one thing that I have not enjoyed about the TV shows, is that we're not getting planet names. Like, there's a lot of planets that we visited that it's just like, random planet. And I would really, you know, in the old... in uh, all the Star Wars movies, it's like every planet. It's fleshed out. We know the name. And that's something that I'd like for them to return to. That's just a little aside. So Din is bringing bo to a secret, covert place. He says that she is his guest. And then it's going to go smoother if she keeps her helmet on. Because obviously these are the children of the Watch. And they believe that bo is an apostate because she walks around without her helmet on. But she has always done that. She is the one who is doing, as far as we know, what regular Mandalorians do. And that is not wear your helmet all the time, like this crazy cult insists that you do. Right. Yeah, I love these scenes. They land, they get out the ships, Grogu's with them, just right alongside. And Paz watches them land. You can tell he's real skeptical. Yes. We're gonna we're not we're not gonna stop harping on how good that they've coached these actors into being emotive while having their faces covered. You right. know, with pure body right. language. And we're it's able super to pick impressive. up on that. Yeah. And it's yeah. not just and, it's not just Bo Katan and Din Djarin. It's it's Paz Vizsla and all the little nameless Mandalorians around them. They're like, you know, they're frustrated that Din Djarin's back. They call him out straight up. You're an apostate. You need to leave. And they're right. not happy to see Bo Katan. Well, she, they don't have a name her at this point. But take your friend with you. I think is what somebody what and Paz said. The cinematography between Bo Katan and Paz really points out their body language plus the cinematography is really giving me the sense that there's going to be a conflict, and it's going to be driven by Paz. Um, and we saw this in the book of Boba Fett. Paz is not an antagonist. He's a, uh, for now, he's more of like a frenemy. Like, he's he's there, he, got, he had Din's back, especially in the first season, and I think he's going to continue to have Din's back for a while. But Bo-Katan, and, and not Paz specifically, but Paz's family, the Vizlas, have a, have a history together. Go watch The Clone Wars. Paz's ancestor of some kind, Pre Vizsla, is a titular character in many episodes, and he is a terrorist who believes in not as extreme a way of the Mandalore as the Children of the Watch, but still a more extremist view than the Mandalorians of the Clone Wars era do. And bo is a member of his terrorist group until um, Pre Vizsla goes Maul. too far. Yep. And until Maul, you know, takes over Mandalore. Yeah, and so yeah. we, we could talk an hour about that. Go watch. And we episodes. have talked an hour about that. So <laughs> if you want to check our special number four, that's where we cover all of this history. But 
that being said, Bo Katan has history with Vizlas, and I think that I'm not I don't think Paz knows this, but he has some kind of sense that at least Clan but, Kreese is not to be trusted. And and she call Paz calls her out by her markings on her armor. What does he call her? Little Owl or Night, night Owl, owl or something like Night that? Owl, yeah. which was the group that Bo-Katan led. And amid these criticisms and talks and jabs from Paz, um, Mando says, I'm not an apostate. There are lies about Mandalore meant to keep them in exile. And there's nobody that I can think who would be perpetrating these lies other than the Empire. I mean, what does the New Republic have to gain from perpetrating lies like this? Yeah. And so... The Empire has been sowing lies about the viability of Mandalore and its atmosphere and the planet's livability. Yeah, maybe they want the best car all themselves. Hell, the very first thing we saw in the Mandalorian was a big old brick of Beskar. Maybe that's where they're getting it. Maybe they have facilities that they're mining it here. Right, right, right. You're right. So after Mando says this, Paz says, well, you know, we'll let the armorer be the judge of that. So they head into the cave, and they speak with the armorer. Din delivers the vial of the living waters that he picked up, and Bo-Katan attests to his um, redemption. The armorer tests this water, and she confirms that it is from the Mines of Mandalore, and that he is redeemed, and Bo-Katan, who jumped into the water to save him, has not removed her helmet since she jumped into the water, and so now she is also redeemed and eligible to be a member of the Children of the Watch. And they... Don't ask her. They aren't like, would you like to be a member of our cult? They just say, you're a member. You can stay with us as long as you want. They do mention she's free to go. Um, And then they all kind of celebrate. And the Mandos are tapping each other on the back. They're happy to have Din back. They're happy to have a new sister in Bo-Katan. And I'd say from Bo-Katan's body language, she's kind of reluctant. She's not really this. This is why the convert line does not apply just to her and may not apply to her at all. Because she's definitely a reluctant convert through her body language. She doesn't really know what she's gotten herself into. The convert, I think, more applies to Dr. Pershing being converted to the New Republic's ways. Well, There's a lot going on here in these scenes, too. Uh, One thing I want to note is that each Mandalorian individually, specifically, reaches up and touches her. And it's deliberate, is what I'm saying. It's not like they're all just turning each other, shaking hands, and be like, oh, we have a new member, and Din Djarin's... Uh, back and we're so happy they walk up and delivery deliberately touch her on the shoulder or so on the back you know and then another thing is they all seem to except for one yeah <laughs> except for one Paz he doesn't touch her Paz is hanging out in the back and we keep getting a shot of him and he's kind of looking on and I'm I'm saying I don't think Paz is comfortable with this you know Din's rolled in he's redeemed he's got the dark saber Bo-Katan, former leader of Mandalore, she's rolled in. Like, Paz is kind of the alpha dog among these Mandalorians, other than the armor. And um, he's he's definitely going to get knocked down a peg or two by these guys um, when any conflict comes into play. And then, so the other thing here is she has her own trump card of the Mythosaur hanging out in her basement. Um. She could play yep, that any yep. time, and we don't even know what the consequences of that would be. You know, I think we talked about, at some point, what was it? There's no reason for them to be in exile anymore. Dan has brought the news that you can, the atmosphere is breathable, and we could go rebuild Mandalore, you know? It's all lies. Yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And I think that'll probably be the, um, the mission that we're going to see later on. Um The very last thing I want to point out is that a lot of people were speculating, including us, that the armorer is, you know, not to be trusted. We don't really know a whole lot about her. Um, And that's not off the table. But she very quickly accepted Bo-Katan into the fold, and a lot of the evidence for her not being um, so benevolent was her the way she spoke about Bo-Katan and her rule. Um, She's immediately, she gave Din a task, and he completed that. She's not playing games. She has accepted him in. And so I'm not saying she's not got something going on, but she's being a little more benevolent than I had expected. Um, And Paz is, you know, maybe he is kind of the bad guy here. Maybe he's going to be the root of the conflict among the Mandalorians to come. Yeah, because, I mean, that's Mandalorian culture, right? You know, you got warriors on one side, pacifists on the other, everything in between. And uh, they... 
sometimes want to like each other a lot and sometimes want to hate each other and there's all these divisions and uh, I, right, I think right. that, when they're not fighting someone else they're right. fighting each other I got some predictions so so <laughs> okay so this was a really good episode I'm very happy about this episode I didn't have any problems with it um I mean it's not the single best episode of the Mandalorian but it's up there it's in the top half certainly you know, Din wasn't in every scene, and that's okay, because this gave us a ton of setup. The other two episodes have given us a ton of setup, too. We're about to start getting deliveries on all the setup. That's coming real soon. That's part of my predictions, is that we're about to start getting some hardcore deliveries on what they've set up. But this episode was super important for us to understand what's going on, and the world building was just supreme in this episode. So, Colin, let's hear your final thoughts about this episode before we hop into the predictions. Yeah, I want to echo all of that. Um, I'm so pumped. This world building is is what I live for. And then, of course, it's, the icing on the cake is the TIE Interceptors here and the, the space battles. Watching these ships do what they do, going against these grizzled veterans, Bo-Katan and, and uh, Din Djarin. Uh, and, you know, we as fans... It's not just a casual one-off. I'm like, oh, I ran into some perils. Here's a speed bump, right? We know there's something else going on, and I'm so pumped to see how this plays out. So pumped. It, who's this bad guy? You know, I. We can obviously, the breadcrumbs were laid here at the very start. We skipped over it, unfortunately. We circled back at the end, but the guy said when they when um, Doctor Pershing first met the Imperials at the uh, Amnesty housing. Oh, I heard Moff Gideon. He, I already escaped on route to the war tribunals. Well, who else is going to have this much power? And, you know, you throw an actor like Juan Carlos Esposito behind him, he's got to come back. He's got a personal vendetta against Mandalore and Mandalorians. And then it's got to be Bo-Katan. Uh, how is this going to play out? Am I going to be wrong? We're going to see. Right. Yeah, I'm right. skipping ahead again. So, you know, <laughs> we were... We were um, right and wrong about this episode in our last predictions. Um, we debuted Always in Motion, last Mandalorian episode, and we had some hits and misses. You know, we said this was going to be, the next scenes were going to be on Coruscant. That delivered. We got a lot of information out of the way. We knew that Din was going to be redeemed um, in these ep in this episode. Um, we missed it on the Mythosaur. I think we both predicted that there was going to be some Mythosaur combat. Like, that was going to be how the last episode opened. And that was completely ignored. I mean, that was there was no Mythosaur in this episode. So they're really saving that, probably for the finale. Um, you know, if we didn't get it in the immediate subsequent episode, I'm comfortable to say it's going to be finale. And so we got, you know, we had some hits and misses. You win some, you lose some on the prediction battle. But we're going to keep predicting. We're going to keep moving on. We're going to keep speculating. And some may say we're even going to irresponsibly speculate. <laughs> but that's the fun of being a Star Wars fan. And so we're going to hop in right now into Always in Motion for our Mandalorian predictions. Difficult to see. Always in Motion is the future. All right, Colin. Get the Master Yoda ears on because I want to know what your predictions are for the next episode and the rest of the season. Well, I've already, Hit me with them. I'm already brimming full of them, right? So, I, I tipped my hand just earlier before. Moff Gideon's going to come back. He's, I think he's the big bad. I can't predict. Next episode? No. He's coming I back next episode? I don't know next about episode. next episode. Uh, okay. Okay, so what's going to happen? you got to specify. We need your predictions for both. <laughs> next episode, you know, this, this is what happens in every... We sit in the Bad Batch all the time. You know, a mission is finished, and a new mission gets assigned to our characters. So, uh, we've got a soft... Uh, unity with the Mandalorians. So they're going to get tasked with something in this next episode. Uh, I, I, I want to say a distress call from Navarro. And Dan's going to whip the Darksaber out. These are my friends. And hey, they were living on Navarro before, you know. And uh, we can assume, you know, these guys were, you know, they were living in the shadows before, but they don't have to now, right? And so they're going to go to Navarro and, and put a big old can of whoop ass onto a, <laughs> a Pirate King Gorian Shard. And I think that's next episode. And then 
but as far as the wider thing, obviously we're going to get Grogu's first words at the end of this. I think he's going to say this is the way. They're all going to say it, and he's just going to pop off with it. Uh, that'll be at the end, obviously. Um, the mythosaur. You know, this is, uh, you know, you see a, a gun sitting on a table. There, there's a term for that. I'm, I'm not going to say it for fear of butchering it, but... Chekhov's gun. Yeah, Chekhov's gun. is It's going to be used... You, they're not going to sit there and create the art assets for a mythosaur and it not be used. There's going to be some sort of confrontation in the minds of Mandalore where this mythosaur is is encountered. And that's going to be, it, I hope it's not a cliffhanger, but we're going to have some sort of cool resolution with that. And then, of course, um, Dr. Pershing, I don't think we've seen the end of him at all. Uh, there has to be something more with the strand casting, right? Uh, the actor's too good to, to waste on this stuff just for a one-off episode. We don't get to see this much setup and build for... I mean, we've got a, we've got a new character in the Lie Kane. I really liked her performance. I really liked what was going on. Uh, you know, it, this is... Uh, this had Andor vibes. I really liked that. I think... Uh, it played well with audiences and stuff. And so I think we're going to get this. This brings that other element into it where not only do we get the action of the Mandalorian, but we get this covert ops that is like a, a B plot that coalesces into a main plot that I hope we get to see. But Yeah, no, I think I want to echo some of your predictions right off the bat. I totally agree. The next episode, we're headed to Navarro. And I've got a little evidence to back that up. First evidence I'll use is the trailer scenes. We see Mandalorians drop shipping on Navarro. We see them fighting somebody. Paz is there. No conflict. There's a bunch of Mandalorians involved in the fight. This is coming, but it's going to have to come early because they're going to want to build up this inter-Mandalorian conflict. And so it's coming next episode. The second bit of evidence I have for that is Carl Weathers is back in the director's chair for next episode. And so I think that Carl Weathers is absolutely... I mean, he's obviously going to direct an episode. He's in. And so that's that's money enough for me that we're headed to Navarro. The next prediction for the next episode is going to be a little bit wider of a prediction. I thought about it all day, and I seriously couldn't think of anyone but one character perhaps two characters, that may show up here. And that is because this next episode, episode 4, chapter 20, was written, or sorry, yes, was written by not just John Favreau, but also Dave Filoni. So we're getting either Rebels or Clone Wars content incoming to this next episode. Oh, and I think awesome. it's going to help us with the Ahsoka buildup. And I'm going to, I'm going to, this is where I'm going to jump out on a limb. This is where I'm going to get on shaky ground and say that the the two characters that could possibly show up, and they're not both going to show up, it's one or the other, is Sabine Wren is coming in the next episode. For some reason, she's going to get involved. Or, because Dave Filoni also helped write episode 7, so she could be being saved for that. But I think we're going to get Sabine in this one. Or Hondo Onaka oh is gosh. showing up in the next episode. Because the pirate thing. I think that the the pirate stuff, the pirate setup, Navarro is a good setup for Hondo Onaka. We know he's still alive because he's at Galaxy's Edge. He's on Batu during the sequel trilogy, and so I, I think we're gonna get. We're I'm I'm really confident we're gonna get some kind of Rebels or Clone Wars heavy nod. Maybe we get Grogu's flashback scene. That could be it. But I know that with Dave Filoni writing, we're gonna get some kind of callback, and so I'm thinking that that's gonna be it. And we're likely to get some kind of cameo. But We've already got and one, right? Bindu Day? Bindu Day. Yeah, we got a Bindu Day reference today. Um, and we got I had a little bit of more information on that. So we here at Star Wars Station, we do the homework so you don't have to. We spend our whole day thinking about this episode, reading up on this episode, Googling stuff, searching things to make sure that we're as accurate as possible for you guys. In the rapid reactions, I referenced the Bindu from Rebels. But Bindu Day is actually a reference to the Dai Bindu monks started on Coruscant long before the Jedi. 
and also had a temple. They had a temple on Kajimi. And so their temple on Kajimi was a, they're like a monk order, but they were called the Dai Bindu, which is a reference to the original Jedi Bindu. And Bindu Day is a reference to them. Okay. And so that little piece of information had eluded me. I had no idea. And so I thought that that was pretty interesting. Um, and so I wanted to bring that to you guys. And so for my last prediction, or not my last prediction, but my prediction that encompasses the rest of the season, I think that, like you said, we're going to have a long-standing Imperial conflict. In the second to last episode, or the last episode, we're going to have a serious battle for the Darksaber between Din, Bo-Katan, Moff Gideon, Paz Vizsla, and anyone else who might get thrown into the mix. But those four are serious contenders. Those are the four I'm definitely saying are going to be fighting for it. And in the final episode, we're going to overcome the Imperial threat on Mandalore with Din riding the Mythosaur. And I'll echo your Grogu thing. It's absolutely going to be that. I'm very curious on what Grogu's going to sound like. Not the way he delivers his words like Yoda, but literally, what voice are they going to give him? I mean, is he going to sound like Morgan Freeman? Is he going to sound like Porky Pig? <laughs> I mean, we don't know where Grogu is going to, what he's going to sound like at all. There's, Porky you know, pig. basically no <laughs> indication. That's hilarious. Yeah, I, I, I didn't even consider that. Uh, gosh, whatever voice that child voice actor ends up with his role is going to be superstar number one. That's going to be interesting. Yeah. A, a legend. <laughs> a legend on the playground, definitely. Yep. Um, so I think that wraps up our predictions, Colin. We made a lot of bold predictions right there, but that's what this is for. You know, we're shooting. We're not shooting in the dark, but we're shooting in some really dim light. We, we're trying to hit the target. Hopefully we get close, um, and we'll see, we'll see next week if we got close at all with some of our, um, with some of our more recent predictions. Um, so we just tried to look into the future, but now let's talk about the future that's a little more concrete. That's the future of Star Wars itself, Star Wars the IP. So this is where we talk about all the news coming for Star Wars on our Holonet News segment. You made the Holonet. Colin, our first story today to talk about on the Holonet News segment is an exciting story. It's really fun. We're going to want to talk about this. It's a little sad because we're not going to be there in person, but we're going to cover all of this news as it comes out for all of you because it's certainly going to be live tweeted. They've updated Star Wars Celebration Europe with the full schedule. So we know all of the schedule of all of the panels that they're going to be debuting, and there's some really exciting stuff in here. I'm just going to pick out some of my highlights, some of the ones that I'm most excited to see. They're opening up the day with their biggest panel. Friday, April 7th, 11 a.m., and I assume this is 11 a.m. UK time. It would not be, it's not going to be happening at nighttime over there. So it's 11 a.m. UK time is the Lucasfilm Studio Showcase. This is where they see, this is where they launch everything. This is where they give us all the new announcements all the new content that isn't directly related to another panel. So we're getting The Mandalorian, Andor's next season, Acolyte, Ahsoka, and anything beyond that that we haven't even heard of yet. Yeah, I can't wait to see an Ahsoka preview. And obviously the new movie coming out. We're going to get some details on that. Uh, I, you know, probably some of the first. We haven't seen the trailer for Ahsoka, so I would bet money this is where this is going to debut. Yeah. Well, no, 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 no. I, I disagree because on Saturday, April 8th, at the exact same time, is a whole Ahsoka panel. Well, so this is absolutely yep. where they're rolling that one out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the day before that, back on Friday at 3 o'clock, is going to be an exciting panel that I don't think we're going to get any big news out of. But I'm really, really excited to just listen to this panel, see what they had to say, because it's the making of Andor Season 1 panel. They're going to get Tony Gilroy and Diego Luna on stage to just talk about what it was like to make that first season, what it was like to film on those locations, how they crafted such an epic story. Um, I'm really, really excited to hear that panel, actually. Yeah, I wish I was there to see this from screen to tabletop panel. Uh, exploration of the process behind making of miniature games for fans across the galaxy. Wow, I didn't even see that one. Yeah, that's that panel's right up our alley. We're definitely going to have to talk about that one. Yeah, there's a new game coming out. That's uh, The Atomic Mass Games folks are putting that on, and they they have a new game coming right around the corner 
that has to do with like hero combat. The name's escaping me right now. It's coming out. Shadow soon. Point. Shadow Point. I'm looking forward to playing that. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Um, there's a, there's a lot of good panels though. We're getting a High Republic panel. That's supposed to they're supposed to launch their last phase, which is Phase Three this November. So you can bet we're going to get a lot of big announcements about that. It's the 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi, so we know that we're gonna they're going to have that. They're getting an entire giant group of folks on stage for the Clone Wars 50, 15th anniversary panel, and that one's going to be really cool. That's going to be super exciting. Yeah, I um, get that. and then we get to tune in to any of this stuff. Is it going to be streamed online or none of it is going to be live streamed? Oh, unfortunately, my this is a super sad piece of news. So we're just going to have to re- rely on all of our friends that are going to be there to be texting us, live tweeting this, um, and we're just going to have to hope to kind of grab where we can get. Um, there's other exciting stuff. I'm happy to see a sequel panel on here. They're doing the villains of the sequel trilogy. Ian McDermott, Annie Circus, and Gwendolyn Christie are going to be on stage talking about their their roles during the sequel trilogy and the villains there. Um, we're getting a look back at Obi-Wan. They're going to bring out Ewan and Hayden, Indira Varma, and Vivian Lyra Blair. And we're going to get a panel about Disney parks and the future of how they're going to bring Star Wars to life at the parks. Yeah, I, I can't wait to be in all this stuff. I know we can't be there you know, trickling in, but man, as it comes out, it's going to be fun. Is there anything about video games? Um, No, I don't think. I've heard this from a few people. Video games are going to have a pretty small presence at this celebration. I don't know why that is, um, but it's going to be, you know, it's interesting that they're doing that, but we know in the subsequent years we're going to get a lot of Star Wars video games, and Lucasfilm had said that their goal is to release a Star Wars video game every six months. Um, And so far, they're actually on track to do that, starting with Squadrons. um, Survival will release within six months out of that. And then I think there may be another project announced that hopefully we'll be getting a rollout in six months. But similar to Squadrons, that was from announcement to, or yeah, from announcement to release was a really short time frame. And, you know, it wasn't, it was a complete game. I will not say it wasn't a complete game, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a $60 game. It was a $40 game because it didn't have a camp. It had a small campaign and it had limited game modes and everything like that. Still a blast. But I wouldn't mind if they released projects like that too that were just kind of fast moving projects that they were like, oh, you know, this is a really cool aspect of another video game we have. What if we just expanded it somewhat? Now, it seems weird to me that they have a whole hour on Funko Pops and that stuff and not anything on a brand new video game that's going to be debuting around the same time this is well i will certainly hear something about survivor but it is odd that they don't have a that they don't have a video game panel just sticking out to you um i'm sure the actors totally would agree. love to show up and do all this stuff i'd love to ask those yeah. people some questions yep i agree i agree but lots of exciting stuff i mean this is going to be a good celebration um also can't forget This is a side note. I know this is a Star Wars podcast, but there's definitely going to be an Indiana Jones panel. I mean, the new Indiana Jones movie comes out just two months after this celebration, and they have never shied away from showing Indiana Jones content at Celebration before. And so that's going to be super exciting. I'm a huge Indiana Jones fan, and I can't wait for that movie. Yeah, me too. I I really can't either. I love Harrison Ford. I like a lot of the stuff he's in. And just the lore and the mythos. I grew up on those films, so... Yeah, that's so fun. They're certainly exciting. They're certainly exciting. So that wraps up our coverage of that part of the news. It's super exciting. We cannot wait to hear all these exciting announcements. It's going to be a fun time, especially with the new movie coming. Um, the next piece of news is we've got some stats on Mando Season 3's premiere on viewership and how it stacks up to the rest of the Disney Plus slate. So Mando Season 3 hit 1.5 million viewers um that is not a number to balk at at all some people are attempting to balk at it though because obi-wan kenobi had two million viewers and you know obi-wan kenobi was a less successful show overall but that does out outshine mando by quite a bit but you have to think about the name recognition that obi-wan kenobi brings with it they got the original prequel actors back for this show they brought darth vader back for Fight scenes and speaking lines. They advertise the dog out of this show. I mean, I'm not... Obi-Wan Kenobi deserves every single one of those 2 million viewers. But to say that Mando is underperforming 
at 1.5 million viewers is just not true. Yeah, I'm kind of skeptical about those numbers. But I will say, though, some of the casual conversations I've had out in the world, uh, one friend of mine, or acquaintance really, was he, he watched season two of Mandalorian and went right into season three and was confused. He's like, I thought Grogu went to go be with Luke Skywalker. What's What happened? And I'm like, I told you to watch the Book of Boba Fett. All you had to do is watch two episodes. So there might be kind right. of a misstep there of where did, what's going on here? Because if you didn't watch right. the Book of Boba Fett, you have no clue. You know, there were... Well, and speaking of the Book of Boba Fett, that was also had a worse reception than The Mandalorian, but they garnered 1.5 million viewers on their premiere. But I'll also say to, and again, in defense of Mando, and I think that it deserves defending because there are people out there trying to point to this as a failure on Lucasfilm's part, a failure on Disney's part, and just saying that Star Wars is in distress. They're pointing to these numbers. That's not the case. The Book of Boba Fett has a title character that everybody's dad and grandpa loves from the original trilogy. If they're a Star Wars fan, they know who Boba Fett is. He has his own... He was the first title character to receive a TV show for Star Wars that was not a new character like Mando. And the Book of Boba Fett premiered at Christmas time. I watched the Book of Boba Fett premiere with my in-laws because I was at their house in Houston for this. I mean, it's, you know, it's, you're gonna get a higher viewership when everybody's off work and the title of your show is Boba Fett and it only had a couple thousand more viewers than Mando. When you look at the numbers together, they're both 1.5 million. Boba Fett eked it out just by the skin of its teeth. And so that lends credence to how big Mando is. Yeah, there's something going on here. I'm not sure on this stuff. Well, and then finally, we're going to round it out with, um, I, I mean, probably disappointing for Disney that Andor only had 0.6 million viewers. They didn't even clock a million for their premiere. And I think that's to be expected. Expected. A lot of people didn't know who Andor was. I Again, I would say, I, we didn't have the podcast when Rogue One came out, but I loved Rogue One. And my number one criticism of Rogue One is I walked out of that movie not knowing a single character's name other than K2SO and Jen Erso. And so, not knowing their character, or not knowing any other characters' names, was um, a downside to that, that I was just not prepared for. Saul um, Guerrero, and too, I but just, he's, he's a past character. We knew who he yeah, was. Yeah, he had been introduced already, and we knew he was coming from the trailers. We had a lot of pre saw Guerrero warning and conditioning. But just not knowing many characters from Rogue One... Of course, Andor was going to underperform on viewership, and we know it underperformed on viewership, but it knocked, I mean, it was to critical acclaim. It it was nominated for so many awards. The people who watched it loved it. Like, it was, this is not to knock Andor at all, but this is just to put the Mando Season 3 numbers in perspective. Yeah. Um, gosh, I loved Andor. I, I wanted to say, I wish we could see the total viewership of these things, because, you know... I don't know. March is a busy time of year. It's springtime. People get busy. Spring break, yada, yada. I don't, you know, I'm not saying it's a bad time to release it, but that's just strange. Well, also, you're measuring streaming service numbers. How do you know how many unique viewers there are? And this goes for all of the numbers. This isn't a Mando argument, but it's, you know, you have no idea how many people are sitting on the couch watching the episode. You just know that one account has logged in to watch the episode. But me and my wife watch it together. I watch it twice. You know, I mean, it's a, it's, you can't get an accurate depiction of the numbers on who's watching it. But that's the problem with TV in general. I mean, that's been the problem for TV throughout time is that you can only count numbers on what device is streaming it, not how many individuals saw your show. Right. But we'll go beyond that news. That was just, I think, an important tidbit for us to kind of see where Star Wars is at in the larger pop culture zeitgeist. Um, we're going to wrap this up with one of my favorite announcements from all year from Star Wars. I said this on our Twitter. I'm going to stand by this. I believe that this release is going to be my favorite Star Wars story of the year. 
I think it'll beat Mando for me. I think it'll beat Ahsoka for me. I think anything they release Star Wars, this is going to be my favorite thing. And that is the From a Certain Point of View book, Return of the Jedi edition. If you're unfamiliar with the From a Certain Point of View books, it is a celebration of the 40th anniversaries of the original trilogies. So the first one released six years ago in 2017 and had 40 stories told by 40 background characters about their perspective on A New Hope. Three years later, they released a book for The Empire Strikes Back with 40 more background characters telling you their perspectives on The Empire Strikes Back. And it's not just background characters. I mean, they have a perspective in The Empire Strikes Back from Palpatine, but they're all short stories. They're all, you know, five to ten pages long. And so, Return of the Jedi being my favorite and these books being right up my alley, they deepen the movies so much. You can see some random guy in the background and you're like, that was this guy's perspective on this event. It really adds a, a super deep layer to those movies. And I have been waiting for the Return of the Jedi edition since the A New Hope one came out. I was so, so happy to see that they finally released this cover. They revealed the cover. They revealed the authors. They gave us a glimpse into some of the stories. And they gave us the release, which is going to be in September. You know, I've never heard of these books Um it kind of punched me in the face a little bit. Do the Empire Strikes Back one have anything about the Wilro Hood guy, the guy who run around the ice cream maker and why he was doing they that? They did. There is a whole <laughs> I, story so about him. That had stuck in my head. I'd, I'd known this, but I it never grasped it. I, so, yes, thank you. I Just reading some of the tidbits on this new one coming out, uh, chilling glimpse into the mind of Emperor Palpatine, tragic history of the Rancor Keeper, you know, these are stories I want to know, and I can't wait to hear about. I know. They're going to be a lot of fun. And one of the stories I'm most excited about is you and I are both read Brotherhood. We were both thoroughly impressed with it. One of our favorite books to release in 2022. Um, we did a full breakdown on the podcast. You can scroll back and see that full breakdown. It's a really good look into Anakin and Obi-Wan's relationship at the very beginning of the Clone War. But... The writer for that book was a first-time Star Wars writer named Mike Chin. He knocked it out of the park, and I think he nailed Anakin's characterization, perhaps better than any writer has nailed Anakin's characterization in the novel format. And he is writing the Force Ghost Anakin story. He is writing Force Ghost Anakin's perspective on the events of Return of the Jedi. Well, that's going to be and something. It's going to be great. I mean, I can't wait. It's likely the last or second-to-last story in the book. And so, I mean, it's going to be the cherry on top for this whole book. Can't wait to record the episode on this one. That's you might have to break that into a two-parter. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I really, when I tell you, I think this is going to be my favorite piece of Star Wars. I just, I've been a fan of the Star Wars books ever since Revenge of the Sith came out. I read my first Star Wars book in 2006, and I've been hooked ever since. I read a ton of them a year, and this one is, this series, the from a certain point of view series is just phenomenal. Love those books. So that wraps up our hollow net news segment for the day. Lots of good news. We're really excited for celebration. We'll be bringing you coverage of that just like we did last year, but now we're going to hop right into our star Wars moment of the week. You would be honored if you would join us. Colin, what was your star Wars moment of the week? So I am on a family vacation I'm in San Antonio, Texas for a company event. and What a dedicated podcaster that he's recording this yes. episode in our car. Wherever you're listening to this, give Colin a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm bringing it, right? This is, I'm about it. So um, we went to a restaurant called The Magic Time Machine. Uh, I don't want to spend too much talking about it. The, the server's dressed up like characters. I didn't see any Star Wars characters, but what came to our table intrigued me was a, a girl who makes balloon animals. And this sounds silly, but she makes upwards of $200 an hour twisting balloons. Making balloon animals? Balloon That's animals. awesome. Good for and her. So, <laughs> like, I've questioned my existence because I work really, really hard, and she is cleaning up. She has to work weird hours. But um, she 
get make my kids some balloon animals. She has a menu, and these things aren't cheap. It was five to seven to twelve dollars, depending on which one you wanted. But um, I got me a balloon Grogu, <laughs> and she called it Baby Yoda. Of course, like I want a Baby Yoda, or my, my son got a creeper from Minecraft. But I'm like, oh, cool, well, good my, for him. I'm like, I'm not gonna. The other ch- children around the restaurant had balloon lightsabers and i'm like well i'm just going to pop mine from beating it on everything so i got something that i can stick in my little hoodie pocket look like i'm running running around with my own balloon uh grogu it's super cute um i sent a picture to my esteemed co-host mr carter here he might post it on the instagram if he wants um but we, we'll see i i mean it's, it's a cute little thing I, you know you don't think about you know, when you think about Star Wars, it's, it's the TV show and Legos and all these other little things. But something as simple as a balloon animal brings you so much joy. It, it's super cute. It's fun to carry around. I'm looking at it right now. It's got these big ears. It knocked over a soda on the table. So it's not all fun and games, right? It's So, like, <laughs> this thing, this stupid balloon animal has the literal essence of Grogu and doing little clumsy things, right? So, just as mischievous. Just as mischievous. And uh, it's a balloon animal. It, it's so simple, but also so fun, so cool, and so neat. I, I feel dumb that my Star Wars moment of the week is a balloon animal, but at the same time, I don't because it's really cool. I don't think you should because that is really cool. <laughs> um, and you're right. The picture was good. She did a great job. My Star Wars moment of the week also has to do with some Star Wars art. Um, my wife is a teacher, bless her, um, and so she's on spring break, and so she spent um, a few days of her spring break down in Houston with her family, and she went to the Houston Rodeo, and so she was walking around the Houston Rodeo, and th- th- for anyone who's not from Texas, um, you know what a rodeo is, hopefully, or presumably, but the Houston Rodeo is not just a rodeo. I mean, it's a month-long event, it's a carnival, it's all kinds of shops and concerts and wine garden, and I mean... It is a massive undertaking. The whole ground is larger than many cities in the United States. And so it's, it's a really impressive undertaking. And so she was walking through the shops, and there was a whole booth selling old patent art prints from the original Star Wars movies. And so you've all heard at length about my cat, Wicket. Well, Cassidy was kind enough to get me a present from that, and it is the original art print of the patent for Wicket W. Warwick from Return of the Jedi, issued in 1985. Um, And it's got the figures and the drawings of the costume, and it looks so cool. I am really excited to display this. I haven't decided if I'm going to display it in my work office or my home office yet, but I was elated to get this, and she totally surprised me with it. I had no idea it was coming. That's awesome. Yeah, I've seen it on Instagram. You posted it there, right? Yes, I did. I put it on our story. If you're listening to this within the 24 hours that I released that picture, which most of tomorrow will be, go take a look at the Instagram. You'll get to see how cool it is and how happy I am that she was able to get this for me. Yeah, that's an awesome picture. Yeah, it's very cool. So I was really excited to get that. That's my little Star Wars moment of the week. We both have uh, just little nods to the art of Star Wars for our moment of the week. Excellent. Um, And so that was exciting. So with that, our episode has once again come to an end. A little bit longer of an episode than normal. Um, If you're a first-time listener, most of our episodes don't run for two hours. But we had a lot to cover. And I hope that it was worth your time. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you sticked around this long, you probably did. Stuck around this long. Then you probably did. And so we really appreciate your support. We First off, we appreciate your listenership. We could not do this without our listeners. Just by listening to this podcast, you are doing us an immense favor. We love doing this. We'd podcast if we didn't have any listeners. But we do have listeners, and we love engaging with you guys. That's why we're building this comprehensive Star Wars community. We've got, we're on whatever social media tickles your fancy. If you're on Facebook, we've got a very active Facebook group. We've got, it's small. It just started last week, but it's growing quickly, and it's super active. We've got a Discord Come play some video games with us. We've got a Twitter. Come follow it with our blazing hot takes. That's SW underscore station. You can come join us on Instagram at StarWars.Station. See all our memes. Engage with all our polls. We've got a Twitch. 
Colin is going to be streaming his painting, the miniatures for Star Wars Legion on there. We're both going to be streaming Jedi Survivor there. I'm contemplating a Jedi Fallen Order playthrough soon before Jedi Survivor. And if I end up doing the playthrough, I'll certainly be streaming that there. Colin, what is our Twitch? Twitch.tv slash Station Media. There we go. And we've got just all kinds of stuff for you guys. We've got tons on the Patreon. You can engage with us in so many ways. You can get a shout out on this podcast for being a patron. You can be a part of our quarterly book club where we talk about a different Star Wars book in private chat. We'll reference it on our podcast, and it's going to build great discussion. We're both voracious Star Wars readers, so if you enjoy Star Wars books, come join our Patreon, come join the book club, and if you join the book club early, you'll probably get a you'll probably get some input in what book we're going to pick out first, and then every member of the book club will consistently have input on what we pick out. And we've got all kinds of stuff and all kinds of tears. If you like the rapid reactions and you're like us and you get up early to watch The Mandalorian, then you'll be able to hear our, hear our rapid reactions as soon as you finish the episode. It'll totally be worth it for you. And we just appreciate all of your engagement with all of our content. Yeah, there's a lot out there. Who are our patrons? We have two now, right? Yeah, we've got two super active patrons. We appreciate their patronage so much um, and we want to continue to grow that patronage. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the future. We got a lot to offer. There's a lot going on. Uh, don't, you know, two hour episode is one of our longest, but that just goes to speak to the quality of the content that Lucasfilm and Disney's putting out. And I hope the quality of what we're bringing to you, because this is some insightful stuff that we're talking about here. And it's so much fun to talk about. Hopefully, you engage with us on Discord and elsewhere. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We love doing this every week. We're going to be back next week with our coverage of The Mandalorian Season 3, Chapter 20. We don't know the name yet. We'll have that for you whenever it comes out. We hope you continue to stick along this ride for us. Next week, we'll be halfway done with The Mandalorian. Yeah, looking forward to see what happens. It's so fun. It absolutely is. Thank you guys for listening. We appreciate all of you. May the Force be with you, and keep it wizard. Thank you. Have a great day.